Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Chris Before Coffee. Today we're going to continue the discussion that we started with yesterday about some of the conflict in Ferguson, what seems to appear as a military occupation um, by the US government. So here I picked out this wonderful uh, picture that really does seem to demonstrate the way the police in Ferguson don't seem to get the paradigm shift that we've gone through. Last night I was watching this uh, live stream from Carg Argus Radio which is a local radio station and this guy um, was really really brave, um, was just live streaming this video footage of peaceful protesters uh, who once the sun went down the police decided no longer had a right to to be there and I I turned the sound off because sound never really works on the live streams when you try to do it like this but if you um, check out my Twitter stream at Mr Chris Ellis you'll be able to see uh, the link to this that I tweeted last night I stayed up really late and it was just a very I mean you really felt like you were there and the chat was going around he was coughing because of all the tear gas you really felt for him he was interviewing people he was getting people's comments and suggestions nobody there was being aggressive um, the police then around this this period of the video here is about eight minutes nine minutes in they start throwing uh, explosive projectiles at the protesters rubber bullets and tear gas there you go and the, the, also there was sound, there was like sirens in the background that were designed to make their eardrums um, like hurt so you had to put your hands over your ears, some people said it affected them less than, than others so they're trying to drive these protesters into the residential areas and it was kind of like a, what's called a bullpenning technique or a kettling, no, that's called kettling where you try to kind of trap people so a lot of people couldn't even get home anyway because they were locked into these kind of cul-de-sacs so I, I just don't know what to make of this. There were numerous tweets going out last night. Let me just see if I can pull this up with Palestinians were, who were actually uh, giving advice to people in Ferguson about how to protect themselves against the uh, you know the tear gas and so on really as we've been saying in the, in the past shows that this is a rebellion against government and control we, individuals don't have a problem with one another and the way this whole dispute has been framed as like a race issue I think is a total red herring so today um, I'm joined by Nick and Jamie say hi everyone hey everybody how's it going very well hey guys it's great to be on again so were you guys up watching this last night? I was for a little while. Uh, I, I took a break after the uh, World Crypto Book Club with Tom, you know, to spend some time with my fiance, and then um, later in the night I started following it up a little bit before I went to bed. But uh, yeah, it's been crazy, man. I, I, I'd like to see us in the Bitcoin community maybe do something to try to get uh, some funds together to buy these people some, you know, painter's masks or spray bottles so they can put water in Moloch. Uh, I think it's Maalox in it or something that, that you can use that to uh, uh, get rid of the tear gas. I guess uh, the antacid breaks it down. What, what struck me though, Nick, was that the, the, first of all, mainstream media wasn't reporting this as it was happening. This was actually happening, but none of the news channels were talking about it, not even Rush Today, and they usually jump on something like this. And what struck me was just this total... Al Jazeera difference. was there. Were they? Oh, yeah, they got, they got tear gas shot at them. You didn't see those pictures? They were set no. up to film. They got tear gas shot at them, and they fled, and then the cops came over and took down all their equipment. Yeah, I mean, I heard the cops... One sec, I'll, pull you, I'll, I'll give you a link. Yeah, I heard the, the cops say out on their loudspeaker that they had to turn off their cameras just before they started this kind of slow march down down the road. I mean, it, it really did look like something out of China, you know, 20, 30 years ago. It was, it was pretty remarkable. They were announcing over their loudspeaker, too, that we are not denying your right to assemble. We are not <laughs> denying your right to assemble. As they're then, tear gassing people. Uh, right, and then immediately after, oh, go to your homes, get off the street. Like, what? You're not denying what my... What is your stuff, problem? But don't assemble. And then yeah. we we also had some journalists that were arrested. I'm seeing I can uh, find the tweet. You, you guys go ahead. What were you going to say, Jamie? Yeah, it's, it's martial law. It, there's 
no question about it. It's just, and you know, we see places like Business Week and New York Times has reported on it. Now all the mainstream media has picked up on it. I saw the front page of CNN now is that's it's all over and pretty much everybody has come out and said basically that you know it's a military occupation of Ferguson and you know I think we'd probably be better off with a military occupation the military isn't as well funded as the police and would the people would be getting funds from the CIA and and back in support. They're also uh, a little bit well, more well trained and well mannered than the police as well. They can't just go off and start fucking shooting people in the middle of the street just because they're in a war zone. Right. It's the police are way out of control and on such a goddamn authority trip that. It, I mean, the gang mentality of the police officers today is incredible how they, I mean, they pull guns on people and hold people at gunpoint for just being there. I mean, being around guns my whole life and knowing about guns, you don't point a gun at something unless you intend to fucking kill it. And Yes, I heard people say that last night. That's a really interesting point. I heard that, that you should never point a gun at someone unless you absolutely intend to use it. Yeah, and these cops, they're fucking pointing guns at people just for the hell of it. And they're like, well, all we want to do is get home safe to our wife and kids at night, and that's not a goddamn excuse. Right, right? So get behind your fucking ballistic shield or something. Don't fucking point your gun at people. You wait until someone's pointed a gun at you before you raise yours. Right. And, and I also would like to remind our audience um, that you can take part in this discussion, the Q&A, bottom left-hand corner. We always love to hear from you. Um, before I do, though, I wanted to talk about this. This is uh, Wesley Lowry. He's a journalist. I think he works for the Washington Post. And he was arrested in the McDonald's where the journalists were camping out and like uploading their stuff. And they were just told to leave. And he was told that he wasn't leaving quickly enough, him and one other journalist. Uh, were then arrested. Apparently, they were slammed into a door. He had his head like like knocked against the door because he didn't know which door to go through. And then he was making calls, getting someone to tweet from his Twitter account so that everyone knew where he was and that he was okay. And then he said that they were released without any paperwork at all. It's like released without any charge or any paperwork. And the only reason why they did it is because he obviously he's funded by Jeff Bezos of Amazon obviously Washington Post is owned by the guy that owns Amazon and so he had that kind of clout and his point was well yeah that's lucky for me but what if you know there's a lot of people in Ferguson who don't have that many followers who weren't able to wield that kind of influence I mean these are the pictures from yesterday I gave a little hat tip to Barack Obama and the CIA I suggested that maybe they set up like a franchise deal Maybe they could export this kind of culture. I don't know. It's an idea. I don't know if they've ever thought of that before. No, I was always of the impression the Second Amendment rights, I'm pretty sure that's what the Second Amendment means. I'm pretty sure it means you can do this kind of thing. Or maybe it doesn't. Maybe it's actually intended for the people in case of an event like this. Maybe that was what it was meant for. So I think that, you know, um, mm, well, I think lots of things. I'm not sure. I want to know what everyone else thinks. What's funny is, is people actually think the, uh, that the Second Amendment is defining uh, that the militia for the state can have guns, and that's not what it says at all. It says that while the militia as part of the state, you know, needs to have guns to defend a state, it's really stating that it's for the people. It's for the people to have the right to have guns, not for the militia. It already assumes the militia is going to have them, that the state is already going to have them. It's for the people. 
So it doesn't matter if these cops have guns. There's no guns pointing at them. And if there was, it would be righteous in their in, in its in its uh, cause because these are the people who are oppressing. It's the occupying force who's already murdered a person in their town, cold blood in the middle of the street because he would not listen. And what, what, do you, what do you guys make of Anonymous' intervention? So last night, Umar Haik, who's like this economist, Twitter blogger, he was saying, why the hell isn't the US central government intervening like they always do in, in, in other matters outside of their borders? Why aren't they intervening now? And then what was happening was people were calling, it was almost like a Batman call, like the people of the internet were calling on Anonymous. And I, I subscribe, and now I'm definitely a person of interest, I subscribe to the Anonymous subreddit, and I, you know, I follow their actions. I've never taken part in any of their things, but I follow them, and I, I'm interested. And it was almost like the calling of a superhero. Come and save us, one of the tweeters said, uh, if I recall. And so I went on to their subreddit. I won't show it on screen because they're also allegedly tweet, um, posting up the name of the cop who allegedly shot this this um, Mike Brown, um, poor chap. Um, and they're, allegedly they're posting up his name, so I, I can't show that on screen because I think that would be irresponsible. And, and I'd like but, to say it's it they've I've seen two names pop up in the last you know less than 12 hours so we people need to really be cautious with this kind of shit and you yeah, don't want to incriminate the wrong person and then right. you get an innocent man killed because you you were too gung ho for uh, vengeance like right. let's let's right. slow down folks let's make sure we have the right person and then we will take it from there Absolutely, and I think also remember how easy it is for someone to manipulate a picture of a Facebook page, right? So people have been posting up pictures allegedly of family, relative members of the cops that were involved, um, and then you know it says all kinds of like you know inflammatory, incriminating things, and of course anyone could just get into Photoshop and make that image. You've got to look for traceability. So I'm not going to scroll down this page just in case I see it. You know, on the World Crypto Network, we like to give you everything you need to go and do the investigation yourself because you are on the front line. But the hashtag to look up is Op Ferguson uh, right here. And last night I saw a lot of one of the most interesting things about Anonymous is they don't take shit, right? Like anyone like just by talking about it, you're already in it. It's like a bit like Al Qaeda, it's just an idea. It doesn't have like physical boundaries. And one of the things that often happens uh, on their forums is someone will come in and they'll say, How can I help? And the first response from this this op on their website last night said, "You can't. Like, if you can't use a computer, you're just a liability. Like, just just make just sit back and watch first. And then someone came in and said, "Don't be rude, you know, and all this." And he's like, "Sorry, mate, but there's other people out there who will be a lot more rude than I just was." And they will. So I was like looking at this thing, going, "This is this is like the people's military. This is almost like I I would normally have come down on the side of the critic who said, "Don't talk to people like that." But when I heard his repost, like there are other people out there who won't be this polite, and I was like, "Shit, th these people really are just regular folk, just picking up." whatever they can to do what they can with what they have. They're taking up the position of the, po the police, you know, the, the actual citizenry is now assuming control as police officers themselves. That's what the a way it should be. is. That's the way it should be. The people should police themselves. It's that self-government and that's what I believe in as a individualist and I describe myself as an anarchist. Um, I'm not about going out and breaking windows or stealing stuff. I, If there's no law, it doesn't mean I'm going to go out and start killing people or anything. It just means that, you know, I want to have what's mine and let people have what's theirs, but to go out and start stealing and it's just not right and I will defend somebody else that's being having an injustice done to them too and I think that's what anonymous is kind of about as well but I, I'm, I'm not sure that there's an opportunity really to do I mean all we can really do is be journalists I think like retweeting this stuff tweeting out the live stream from last night was the most impact that I could have had with what I what I could do at the time, and that's what politics is. It's about what you can do with the power that you have now, um, and 
I, I, you know, you kind of feel a little bit powerless in, in, in a way. Like, I wasn't sure, maybe I should go investigate, and I, you know, maybe I should go on tour and see if I can find the name of this guy, and then, because one of the things that Andy Carvin does really well, um, have you seen this guy? He's a journalist for, at least used to be for NPR in America, and he is just like the most manic tweeter. Like, if you follow him, you'll get nothing but relentless stream of fact-finding. And he actually crowdsources a lot of his journalism. He calls it distance journalism, and he'll like ask questions of people saying, right, I've got this photo, can anyone verify it? And then people go off on Google and they verify it. And then they come back and it's like, right, I've got this citation, I've got this citation. I mean, and I think that we should be doing this for 9-11. You know, I watched some of the, I don't want to derail the conversation, I just, quick, quick tangent. Um, I was watching some of those conspiracy videos on 9-11 and I was thinking, you know what, there's too much entertainment in this video. There's, there's some, some little bits of truth in here, but what needs to happen is you need to like upload all the raw footage and every, and that all needs to be hashed and then everyone needs to go through it and then we start to piece it together like as individuals. We start to go through the evidence. That, that's what Andy Carvin does here is he starts like fact finding, like if someone starts reporting something he'll go right, everyone needs to find like more pictures from different angles, get more people onto Twitter. So this is this is the uh, this is like the Arab not, Spring. This is like the uprising. To, uh, not trying to like be a downer on this, but 2001 was a slightly different time as well. You know, not everybody had cameras in their pockets and uh, access to social media. And we do you know, like we can, We do we can, now, but we we we. What I'm saying is, is like right now we have so many more perspectives viewing like an incident than we did in 2001, and. Just the, like raw footage is just going to be probably next to impossible to get. I, 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 if I was the government, I wouldn't even have kept it. I no, wouldn't no, even have kept raw footage. WikiLeaks has already released like the, all the pages that all the law enforcement officers had on them. They've already dumped all of that raw data. Someone's been through it already um, and just filtered out all, all the crud. But this, the, what, what's lacking in the conspiracy tinfoil hat community is any contr evidence control. They're just as bad as the, the conspirators in the government are because they're just building narratives and then getting the facts to suit the narrative. I think what we should be doing is, not necessarily with 9-11, but certainly with everything that happens now, We will, all, when, when Anonymous released the dispatches audio files from Ferguson, around the, the, the shooting itself last night on YouTube, people were going through the YouTube video and time stamping it. And actually what was really interesting about that audio file was that there was no police report of the shooting of Mike Brown, right? Dispatch only heard about the shooting via the media. So the lady working at Dispatch was like, I'm hearing reports on the news that so, so someone's been shot um, in, in, you know, in Ferguson, can anyone, like, and no one reported back. So people were going through this footage. Now what you need is evidence control. That document needs to be hashed. That hash needs to be distributed over people because if that gets tampered with, you need to know, right? So you need to be able to prove that that file existed at that time. You need to be able to put all these kind of trails and then people need to download the evidence. They need to go through it, submit their timestamps. And then you crowdsource it like that. Because essentially that's what good detective work should be. At the moment, the police have got the monopoly on evidence control. Because the evidence sits in their office behind that wall where we can't see it. But now everyone can have the evidence. My well, problem with mass surveillance is who controls the surveillance. And then, I, I, I was just making the point that in 2001, it's just, there, we can't go. It's going to be too hard to go back in time to do this thing. But we can do it going forward is, yeah. is, is, would be my point. Genuine. Yeah, to set a new standard to start doing things that way, right, it's going to be nearly impossible to go back and redo what's already been done. But if we start to do things like that now and, you know, set up a standard for setting up evidence and collecting evidence that way, it would be a good way to... Uh, keep the evidence chain clean because yeah there's so much tampering of evidence and the way the police have it now is a police officer is accused of you know if a police officer goes out and kills somebody or beats the shit out of somebody for no reason 
Well, they get investigated by, oh, somebody else, maybe in the by the police force in the next town is how the investigation goes. But they're drinking buddies when they're off duty, and they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't see anything wrong with that. We do that all the time. We all we go and beat people up. That's what we like to do when we're on duty. You know, we have the authority. Well, he's also on paid leave, this police officer, right? So he's oh, yeah. paid to take time off. Oh, yeah, I want to go out and go on vacation for a couple weeks, but I'm out of vacation days. I'll just go out and beat the shit out of somebody, and I'll get a two-week paid vacation. Well, let, let, let's go to some questions. We've got two questions here from Dan Gould. If... Um, if I did a business like an individual government, actors do business with a gun, would I be considered a criminal? Yes, you would. If you if you acted like your government, you would be considered a criminal. I'm pretty sure I'm guessing that. Absolutely. That's, that's what, I mean, just look at taxation, right? People argue that taxation is theft. And you're like, well, no, it's not. It's for the common good. Well, the only difference between taxation and theft is it's a fucking group doing it through force and coercion telling you it's for the greater good. Fuck, if I'm going to, Chris, I'm going to come over to your house and steal your wallet for the greater good. I'm going to do that. I'm going to come over to your house and steal your wallet for well, the greater a lot, good. A lot of this, I was watching uh, Veritasium last night, as I often like to do, is that chap who does the physics videos, and they were talking about information. I tweeted it out. Um, it's a video, really good video on information theory. And entropy is a function of interval of information. So by taking a section, take a large blob of data and take a small section out of it, that section becomes ent entropic, becomes more random than the whole thing. Because as, as a species, we're very, very good at bringing meaning and building in narratives to long streams of data by omitting certain things in the sequence and putting, a, and putting more significance on others. And one of the, the sort of interesting things I was, I was sort of thinking of is that I've sort of lost my train of thought a little bit, but it, it was something to do with, with information control. And I think it wasn't that governments were always wrong. I think when Cleisthenes first sort of proposed the, the democratic government in, in ancient Athens, I think that was perfectly right for the time. But what you're doing when you vote now is you're taking a thin slice of your decision-making power in that moment where you tick a box in the booth and you give another group of people four or five years of decision-making ability. And that's not a fair trade. All you're doing is outsourcing your power. One of the, the ladies that were at the, um, the, the riots last night, or the riots, the oppression, she was saying that they want our vote, but they never come down and see us. They never. They want us to. They want the black vote, but they never come down and actually see us. They just send in this kind of military occupying force. And we've got to stop outsourcing our power. It's up to us as individuals to act simultaneously to to reach an agreement, to reach a consensus, the same way the blockchain does. Where what the blockchain did is it said, right, we need a single history. And we do that with these 10-minute intervals, these statistical intervals, where we make something just hard enough that it will take on average every 10 minutes. And then we say whatever happened within that interval of time is the truth. Because you don't have enough energy and the intensity of energy to start rearranging it. right? Because by the time you've done that, the block's already been found by someone else. It's already propagated across the network, and you're on to the next problem. So you, the frauds just don't have time to change the story because they've only got 10 minutes in which to do it. Yeah, and it, it doesn't matter to me. If that group of people over there says, we want this person in charge, and I say, well, I don't want that person in charge. I don't want anybody in charge. Why the hell does that group of people say, well, fuck you. We're going to rule over you anyway. It the whole democratic idea just is not fair to the individual and the idea that if all individuals give up their personal rights for the greater good everything will be better for everybody is just you know the common good is just a a false idea that isn't true because you can't have everybody make things worse for everybody to get things better for everybody. Well, it's, I think it's something to do with the, uh, the interval. 
I think it's something to do with the fact that it's not that democracy is wrong, it's just that voting isn't the most important part of democracy. It's about giving into the individual the, the power of self-determination. If we can all agree that we want freedom of fear, if we can all agree that risk is a distributed phenomenon, that we get quite enough of it from nature itself, then perhaps we can start to come to terms with the idea that there are some decisions that need to be made by consensus. There are others which are don't need as, as many votes and don't need as, as, as many kind of buy-ins as it were, then I think that we're going to start getting somewhere. You're going to start getting back to what we were talking about last night with the city-state where you still have a certain element of voting, but the voting, I mean, you vote every time you go out and spend your money in a shop. You're voting with your, your spending habits. You vote every time you know, where you tune into a to a TV show, and they can detect that you're you're watching it every time you watch this YouTube. You're voting with your views right now. Right, but even at a city state or a city government, you know, I don't like that I have to pay seven hundred dollars a year for other people's children to go to school. Um, I don't have any children, but yet I'm a landowner, so. I have to pay for all the people that don't own land that have children. I have to pay $700 a year out of my property taxes go to send their kids to public school, which I believe is just an indoctrination camp to mm -hmm. further enslave the rest of us. Do you think that we could see a future where taxation is replaced by crowdfunding? Where if somebody wants to, I, I I would agree, for example, to fund I would like on that. certain conditions, right? So you get this idea of patronage, and it, it's coming back from 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 our past that people pay for things because it feels good to pay for it. Because I believe in the outcome of this, so I believe in the outcome of young people being taught how to think confidently and independently for themselves. If that's what we mean by education, so I will not vote by donating money to that school that's being proposed because that school sounds like an indoctrination camp. But other people that are proposing these ideas, well, this this guy looks interesting. I listen to his podcast and he sounds very erudite, and I'd like to to support him and so I would end up funding that project. Now you've got a much more granular taxation system, have you not? Well, then it's not tax. Tax is a theft system backed by force of government. If you don't pay your taxes, they send you a letter and if you don't respond to that letter, they send people to your house and arrest you. If you still don't pay, they kill you. If it's a crowdfunding thing and you get to choose it's a business and people get to say oh yeah I like to send my kids to that school I will pay to send them there and we will fund that school or no that school sucks we're not going to support them and give them our money it's it's the same way you know competing hardware stores work or any competing software, you know, Microsoft and Apple, or, you know, you vote with your dollars, mm -hmm. and I'm all for that. Yeah, like, you get you get rid of uh, the taxation. I'll send 10% of my income to my local school district. I'm not even going to send my kids to public school, but you know what? If you get rid of taxation so I don't have to pay for your fucking stupid defense, your shitty fucking police, your crappy road system, your stupid politicians, I will give you 10% of my income for your schools. That's more than they get right now. They don't get that much of my income. I'm willing to give them more than they already get if they just don't force me to pay for the other shit. And I will do so willingly with a smile. I will go down there and hand them a wad of cash once a month. So once the these barriers start to become less significant and they become less important. I'm particularly at the moment in my head I'm thinking of this convoy of humanitarian aid that's currently making its way from Russia into eastern Ukraine in what appears to be a kind of I don't know a weird tactic where Russia is sending in this this aid with these kind of military convoy in an attempt to make itself look like it's doing the right thing because you know Ukraine isn't looking after their own people well enough and then Ukraine is also sending their humanitarian aid it's like they're falling over themselves in this propaganda war to make themselves look like they're acting reasonably and I want I'm reminded of 
Plato's anxiety that democracy leads to tyranny because fundamentally the public can't be trusted. This was the this was the anxiety that people won't fund things like garbage disposal or they won't fund projects that they can't anticipate the importance of it in the future but he believed that the the sophos the episteme the gold soul people that they did they had that ability to to think long term and they could be that they could take care of that kind of planning so how do we address that issue they'll start to pay for garbage pickup once <laughs> they have they're living in a fucking garbage dump um that the whole idea that, oh, you guys aren't smart enough to think that you're going to need a garbage truck coming around picking your garbage up, so we're going to force you and make you pay a monthly fee or a yearly fee to have garbage pick up because you're too fucking dumb to think ahead, so if you don't, we're going to kill you, isn't even, it shouldn't even be a viable option. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Je Sometimes shit's got to get worse before people are going to be like, you know, maybe I got to do something about this. Fuck, I just lost a leg. Maybe I should stop fucking doing things that uh, like make my diabetes kick the fuck off. But how do you make it anti-fragile so that I don't... I make a mistake that's big enough that I can learn from, but that's not so big that I end up being crippled? Say that, say that again. Sorry, I was reading the so question. How, so. how do I... um? How do we make it so that we, we're allowed to make mistakes that are significant enough that we can learn from, but are not so significant that we destroy any possibility of making more? Are, are you talking about individually or collectively? Well, Individually, uh, if you're going to make mistakes that end in your death, that's a learning experience for everybody else. So, Well, I'll give, I'll give you a practical example. So take nuclear power. If we all die tomorrow, it's not as if another civilization can come back and replace us because these nuclear power plants require round-the-clock maintenance. And so these things will just go, you know, nuclear, literally to start spewing out crap into the atmosphere and life itself will be wiped out. So you wouldn't even be giving an opportunity. It's like we're playing a martingale strategy with nature itself, you know, the, the strategy in gambling where you just keep redoubling your your stake every time you lose and the idea being that eventually you know hopefully the odds of you losing are like four million to one but people don't understand randomness randomness doesn't mean it will never happen or it's very 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 unlikely it could happen right now right that could have that could be your very first bet that could go, that, that it could happen to you on but you don't anticipate it because you think well the odds are really slim yeah I, I, I don't know. People that. need people want energy, right? So they're going to pay for it and maintain it. I've I've I worked think in that's a very I've, simplistic way of looking at it. I don't know. I've worked. Do you know how much you get paid to work in the energy industry? It's fucking stupid. You make so much goddamn money working in the energy industry. It, it, that's incentive enough to keep people to want to get keep it going. I mean, yeah. you go uh, twenty bucks an hour is cheap labor in the energy industry. It really is. Yeah, you, the, most people probably make closer to thirty plus an hour, and that's not and that's not including their benefits like retirement or health care, etc. I mean, I've I've been in refineries where people who hold stop signs for the cars driving down, uh, you know, the trucks driving in and out of the refinery are making eighteen bucks an hour, not including their benefits. Oops. Then you've got to include in their health care and everything else. That's it's twenty five, thirty bucks an hour. That's a shitload of money to hold a stop sign. But the truth is, though, we don't, we can't, we're terrible at predicting the future as a species. And as a result, is, is Plato not really onto something? Are we terrible at predicting some... the future, Chris? By what metric are we terrible at predicting the future? Are we worse at it than squirrels? Are Ooh, we better Actually, at you know what? You know what? I, now you mention it, I think we probably are. Because look at, like, this, this sort of gambling addiction that, that we've got in the crypto 
space, right? Like this guy here, who was, I was going to introduce this later, but I'll introduce it now. I've lost everything and I'm just here to say goodbye. It will miss you. You see, because the real value of the community was the other people around. It was like, you know, talking about your day and, and, and sort of calling each other shy and, and shit like that. But this guy's lost 150 grand because he wasn't using stop losses. And the fact is that throughout history, we have had scientific revolution after scientific scientific revolution that only goes to show that these scientists are just in the business of proving each other wrong and so science has always been wrong like we've always had to readjust and have our paradigm shifts and then and then grapple with the new reality and Thomas Kuhn writes about this in the structure of scientific revolutions Heidegger talked about it although in, in a slightly different way in being in time and I think that what Plato is getting at is that it's all about your ability to anticipate demands in the future in the case of mar markets but also to anticipate risks and I think I, I love this idea of, of volunteerism and I, I really do but I'm still trying to work out what the structures are going to be what are the where are the buffer zones going to be because it does take a long time to achieve agreement among people what if there is a foreign threat for example if, if like the US goes voluntary but then there is a group of people, a superpower outside of it that wants to take over. How are you going to quickly enough fund a military uh, or, or stage any kind of, of response or defense to it? Why would they want to take over? Okay, that's a, it's a good question. But can what we not see a situation? Over for? Uh, 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 or land. A gun behind every blade land? of grass, Chris, there are more guns in America than there are people. All right, just think about that for a second. If you have 300 million people lobbing little fucking pebbles in one direction, that's going to level anything, anything. There's no force big enough outside a nuke that is going to take care of it. And what's happening in Missouri is the people are too fucking dumb to see that it's an occupying force and not, they don't understand that what the police are doing is wrong and they have every right to defend themselves and Chris I'd like to make another point about you saying are we dumber than squirrels have we not been conditioned to be dumber than squirrels have we not created systems that allow you know child proofing the planet so idiots who maybe should have learned their lesson long ago didn't learn their lesson because we kept saving them you know, let's be honest How, are we dumber than squirrels because naturally we're dumber than squirrels I, I would say, say we no. Were than no, no, I know, I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm, we, I'm they just... seem to reach some kind of equilibrium with their environment. I, I got you. I'm, it, I'm just. I'm just. I'm just, just using. They, uh... they seem to be good at predicting the future, in as much as they don't seem to have developed any tools like we have. But we seem to be that part of nature because we are as much part of the animal kingdom as they oh, yeah. are. That always wants to break up against our boundaries, to really overcome them, whether it's an artist using the, the constraints to, to produce works of art, like the painter and the brush on the canvas, or, or, or whether it's the scientist coming up against the edges of their knowledge and trying to break through by trying to imagine alternatives under which the same rules would still work. And I, I think that why, to, to Jamie's question, why would anyone want to invade? Well, I, I would say like well, Russia would just say, we want the land, we want the natural resources. And if they can't cooperate and they can't stage a good enough response to our threat of force, then why wouldn't they just go in there and take the land? The reason they invade, though, would be for the natural resources and to enslave the people for taxes. So the worst thing that could happen if we had a voluntary society is we'd end up with what we got now, a fucking government. I have to I have to agree with that. That the worst case scenario is today, right? Like mm -hmm. that this is where we are. This is a worst case scenario. We have uh, huge authority figures who can basically just kill people at will, right? They can drone you at your wedding, and in a foreign country, you never even met that person, but you decided it was time for you to die. Yeah. So, so I I think the the risk of going to a voluntary society is a lot less than going on with what we have because the worst case scenario is that we'd eventually get back to what we have now. That's a really good point. So if you're watching this, please could you put a timestamp to that point and then I'll put it in the description afterwards. Um, and, really I'd like that. to make a, a 
David Gilson said something. He goes, furthermore, calling taxation theft is somewhat of an overreaction. When individuals stealing money only have a mandate for their own benefit, politicians have been given a mandate through vote. But I voted against it. So here we go, no, David it's Gilson. Not I'll really give you an example. Chris is, Chris is our politician. David Gilson, Jamie, and I are voting on we want new cell phones. I want a brand new cell phone. I can't afford a new one, but I want a new one. Jamie wants a new one. David Gilson could probably afford it. So we're going to vote that, Chris, we need you to get us new cell phones. Any means you need to get the money to do it. David Gilson, how do you feel about that? Do you not feel like you're being stolen through, that I'm not voting for my own self-personal interest, that this politician is not going to execute said plan in his own self-personal interest because he wants well, to continue to get our votes and continue to get our funding? The, so the problem is at the moment is we're giving himself. too much time to the politicians. We're giving too much money and too much time, and the granularity of that decision-making makes them unaccountable. I'm giving I, him I, I four agree. years I'm, of discretionary decision-making. I'm giving him like 30% of my net income, and also I have to pay my, when I pay my tax, I also pay next year's in advance. But that's why yeah. this is theft. That, 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 exactly. That's why that's this becomes saying. theft. That's that. That's not why it's not. I I, I get what you're saying, it's but I'm just I'm just trying to. Say, I'm saying this to David Gilson as as one of the audience members. I've invited David as well, so he he can respond. Yeah. Um, it's it's more of an extortion when they send you the bill. That's a extortion because it's a threat of violence if you don't pay. They will come to your fucking house and kill you. By the way, I I'm pay. all for donating and helping people. I want nobody to go to bed hungry because I don't want to go to bed hungry. I think the world is a better place if everybody has a full belly. Then they're not getting so angry that they're hungry. That's just a basic fucking... Okay, okay. Let me, let me play dictator now and just let me just go through because we've got lots and lots of questions coming in but I do want to go back to Jamie's excellent point about risk management. So um, Dan Gould says, would, would there be factual empirical evidence to prove that the consensus decisions apply to me or anyone else? Well, no, I don't. They would. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that, Dan. But I think what you mean is that is there any evidence, like when we vote, that that these decisions actually apply to individuals? No, there isn't, because what you're doing is you're just going by the average. It's like Gaussian. If you if you're familiar with uh, Fooled by Randomness or the um, the Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, he talks about the fact that we are obsessed with averageness. Um, and I, I would say that is that is the problem is that you can't just go to, go to the average. You've got, the truth lies at the edges is what I think Taleb wants to say. That you can't just ignore the outliers or the six sigma events, the ones that are really really unlikely. Just because they're unlikely doesn't mean they don't happen. And if you start to rest on your laurels and think that all that ever happens is the average, then you're going to get caught out by an unexpected event. Um, so who will build the roads? So Dan is also saying like who will build the roads, face palm. Yeah, I, t I totally agree with you. I, I, all I'm trying to work out is how do we anticipate the, the challenges that are difficult to anticipate? How do we resource ourselves and prepare ourselves for imminent threats if it takes a significant amount of time to reach critical mass in terms of resources to respond to the threat? Right, so if we're, if we're facing an imminent threat as a voluntary society from an invading force that isn't a voluntary based society, then how do we tool up and get ready to, to defend ourselves, assuming that that's what we want? Um, Alan Bell, the only chance humanity has to make a world that is so beautiful that would dare destroy it. Artificial intelligence will predict the future, even if it has to create it. So there, there is a really good video um, on Veritasium where they talk about what is randomness and they've got they show these experiments with these coin tossing machines where the machine can regulate it the the toss and the environment to such an extent that it can predict with 100% accuracy what the the, the coins going to do so it's like really really highly controlled environments and it turns out that certain coins like the the, the nickel or the dollar have a, a probability of always landing in a certain way so they just program the machine and it will say, right, it's going to be heads, it's going to be heads, it's going to be tails, it's going to be heads, you know. And the gets do this thing. So it clearly looks as though information stands in for reality. And if you have enough information, you have the reality. You can predict what's going to happen next. It's like Maxwell, the, the thought experiment where if you had an evil demon, that could, or not necessarily an evil one, that could know the position of every molecule or every particle in the universe and it knew like exactly all the momentum and everything, that it would know everything. 
right? It, even the stuff that you thought was private that was going on without anyone watching, it would still know. And But the problem is you need another universe to contain that information. Even if you created such a computer, it would require a whole other universe just to store the information about th this one. So yeah, I agree in principle, I just don't know where that stops because you end up creating a heat death or something. Um, too much information in the universe. Um, and then World Crypto Network, I don't know if this is Tom, um, says voluntary society, resource-based economy, utopia, etc. all assume a level playing field for new ideas, lack bootstrapping techniques to actually make it happen. Anyone want to take that? I disagree. There, there are plenty of smart people that have great ideas on how to do a lot of this stuff. If I... I know people Not having a hammer doesn't mean you shouldn't build a house. That's that's all I'm saying. Exactly. You know, that, just because you don't have the perfect tool doesn't mean you shouldn't at least attempt something. And to, to, to say that the, the reason new ideas don't have an equal playing field or the la lack of bootstrapping techniques isn't because voluntary societies lack these things. It's because the state is in there enforcing that these things aren't there. They, they make sure that the, the playing field isn't even. They make sure that the, the tools to bootstrap... I mean, just look at how the, uh, they tried to write leg, uh, legislation on how Kickstarter... How, how you can fund a Kickstarter. Who can have a Kickstarter? What the fuck? That was somebody created a tool for bootstrapping, uh, uh, you know, ideas, and, oh, fuck that shit. Got to control that. Can't allow uh, anybody to have their own way of bootstrapping things. Got to come in and control that aspect. Look at Uber in New York. Uber is a service layer for taxi cabs and limousines now in New York. Or what's that? Lyft. Lyft, I'm sorry, is a, a service layer mm -hmm. for taxi cabs and, and uh, limos so, in New York. So can we, can we <laughs> define the state? And we're joined by David. I'll come to you in just a moment. Yeah. There. Can we define the, the, the state as something like the ability to, to regulate the relationships between people? Like, I'm only ever allowed to relate to you as a plumber because the state says we're only allowed to transact in this way. When I go to the shopping mall, I have to be a customer. I have to be a consumer. I'm not allowed to take under any other role. Is there a way in which we can understand the state as a force for narrowing the degree of change within society? They're narrowing the outcomes by controlling the relationships we have with each other. Think about it as a physicist. David, you're a physicist. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I think... I, I have total sympathy with a lot of the complaints that have been making about how state interferes with things. Um, I, I just want to say that bit, bit before I be, begin. Um, however, I think there's a certain danger in a lot of stuff that's been saying that it, it's almost analogous to people get drunk and drive cars, therefore nobody should drive a car. Um, because the problem of having a state, well, the, the thing with having a state is that it's as opposed to a voluntary society, um, is that yes, we don't always like the way things are done. However, you need to, how, however you do things, you need to have a fair society, and you need, and sometimes you need a systematic way of doling out help and assistance, etc. Um, and I, I do think it'd be good if there was more of a consensus rather than everyone just getting together to feel good about themselves every few years and vote, and then like have like total apathy and be brain dead thereafter. It would be good if there was some continuing engagement. However, there is a hell of a lot of apathy and I don't know how much people would engage with that. Um, I'm going to hand over because I lost my train of thought. I don't, I don't think they should be forced to engage with it. If somebody doesn't want to participate, whatever. I, you know, if somebody yeah, doesn't yeah. want to learn to fish, I say let them starve. I mean, it's a shitty thing, but we'll all learn from their mistake. Their mistake was not learning to fish. The right. thing is, I mean, the, it's a moral thing, and you know, just because you, people didn't have a better way to pick cotton than have black slaves in the field back in the 1800s, doesn't mean that they shouldn't have abolished slavery. They fucking needed to abolish slavery because it was just fucking wrong, and what the system we have now is fucking wrong. Are we talking about the world in general, or are we just talking about the United States? We're talking about all government. Yeah, uh, we're talking about in general, but what, what I'm interested in hearing from you, David, is as a physicist, 
let's think about this in terms of information science. We, the, the, the room can't hold everyone. Like there is, we're in a closed loop system, the Earth and the Sun. Okay, and there isn't room for everyone. So when I, I've heard from the anarchists before, and I'm not coming down on either side, I'm still open to persuasion. At the moment, I feel myself going towards where Jamie and, and Nick are taking me, but I'm, I'm willing to be persuaded in either direction. The, the criticism I've got and the concern I've got is that there just isn't enough room. We can't all just go off and, and, and do what we like. And then that takes us back to Locke, where you know Locke wants to say, well, my freedom ends where my fist reaches your nose, right? But then you end up with these kind of social contract theories that I didn't feel like the in, the Enlightenment period really ever got. I don't think they ever finished that discussion. But can we just deal with the hard facts to start with? Is there enough room for everyone to just kind of go off and, and, and do their own thing? Do we not need systems in place like, you know, plumbing and things like that? Yeah. And how I does believe, that decision-making uh, process wait, work? Yeah, so this just is to make a comment, I believe there's enough land on the planet for everybody to have more than an acre. Everybody who currently lives right now yes, could have more that's... than an acre of their own land. So, I mean, I would say there's plenty of space. An acre's quite fucking big. I have a book on that tells me how to live self-sufficiently on a quarter of an acre. But that's not the culture we've ended up in now. Where yes. we've gone now is we've got dependencies on grids and systems. Yeah. And we're slowly... Um, I, no, let's say, let's say David's having... Sorry, sorry, yeah, sorry. Yeah, ahead, it's, well, uh, yeah, I think it, it does come down to a matter of efficiency, actually. I mean, you, you do need a certain amount of coordination because less, more can be done with less if things are, uh, things are coordinated and synchronized. Um, I mean, to, for example, take a printed circuit board. A, the, a path from, an in, from one component to another may be taking a heck of a lot longer than it would have to do as, as a crow flies across a board, but, uh, but the whole works because everything work, fits around each other. And I think for, that is directly analogous to public utilities. Um, or let's take the word public out of it. Any sort of utility, everyone's going to have to have like water and, uh, and electricity rooted to them. And it's better if we work together. Because, I mean, for, for, uh, I mean a, a really good example is if people are going to have like cables laid underground. If everyone's doing their own digging, when they want a cable, never mind every bugger else, you're going to have bug everywhere's going to be dug up all the time, and you never know when everything's going to be dug up. But if people got together and, and said, okay, well, we're going to share this line and this line's going to be dug once, that's a hell of a lot more efficient. So, David, now. I have a question on this, though, David. Let's say I dig my own trench and I lay my own cable and I put a sign that says, here's where you can connect to my cable. I, here's my trench along here. Why would you need to go around digging everywhere else if I just took the, the forethought to put a sign here that says, here's where my cable ends. You guys can connect to it if you want. That's fine. However, in the sort of society that you guys are proposing, there's no guarantee and no com compulsion for anyone to actually do that. Is, is Do you believe there's guarantees in life? Do you believe that you are guaranteed also, things in also, life? Also, there's an assumption there that people won't, and we have to be careful not to bring any baggage to this discussion. I liked where it was going. I want to just put a, a case forward, which was the, the way that we enforce the blockchain is by leaving certain things to chance, such that everyone can, like, if we can't agree, we'll toss a coin, because no one has enough information, unlike that, machine that can know what none of us uh, have enough information about the universe to know where it's going to land so whenever we can't agree on something we leave it to chance yeah um, the thing with public utilities I live in the city here I am forced into having city utilities water electricity and whatever if I want to dig my own well on my own land here they won't fucking let me. So a lot of this has to do, doesn't it? There's, there's multiple facets to working out this problem. Partly it's about living sustainably and we're seeing a lot of um, new tools come online that allow you to live off the grid. So that's part of the, the solution, I think, being able to live sustainably where you are without having to be reliant on, a, on an extra body of system. Then you've kind of got this basic human nature argument that I think is best addressed by people like anthropologists and social psychologists, not economists, by God no. I mean, this is going to be people that 
take a big picture perspective that understands certain eternal truths like what has always been true about people um, my friend Larissa from uh, Histories of Things to Come, her blog, she was sort of telling me about the connection between worship and greed. Like throughout history, there'd always been this kind of connection between the people that worshipped and, the, and that greed. That's how the banks ended up taking over the temples, which initially were places of healing. And so you end up, like, as you go through time, the whole language just shifts and just becomes the opposite. The word husia, husia in Greek, um, used to mean something like that that which stayed the same after everything else around it changed but now in modern Greek it means something like substance as in like abusive substance it's completely changed its meaning Usia used to be we used to as a species be surrounded by wilderness by the wild now we surround the wilderness like we've kind of colonized this thing called nature and I think there's a multiple facets to this, and I think what's stopping us from getting any tangible progress globally with this debate is there's a lack of open thinking. People are bringing way too much baggage to the table. They're not leaving prior concerns at the door, and they're coming to this going, well, people are all greedy. That's why that will never work. You know, But you can't make that assumption because what we're talking about, fundamental changes, some of which we have control over, some of which we don't, and we have to pay attention, we have to be planning for the kind of changes we're going to see over the next 20 to 50 years, not the changes over the next few months. We're not taking a long perspective, are we? Yeah, and I, I think something that ties in directly to what you were saying and what Jamie, Jamie's example of the well is there's two reasons I can think of that one would not be allowed to do that on their own land. One, there is a corporation struck government in control that have got their own selfish financial interests at, at heart and, and they want everyone tied in enslaved to paying to the system. Or there are some there are people who work in the water industry who are damn better experts about water management than any of us are, know that there's a damn good reason why you shouldn't do that because there will be unintended consequences for other people. The problem is is that it's not transparent, the reasoning is not shown. And so that leaves everyone to bring in their own baggage and project the worst possible motives onto a result that they didn't want. I live in uh, California right now, and we're in a crazy fucking drought. And we have some very centralized water management here, and they're not doing anything to make it better. I just took a trip up through central California, and there's lakes that are on the map that are you well if you look around you you don't see it you can I, I drove over a bridge and this was supposed to be going over a lake and it said it had a sign no diving off the yeah. bridge there's no yeah. water there's zero water under that bridge there's not water for a hundred feet two hundred so, feet away from that bridge so in that particular case it, it looks are experts. Like it's mismanaged but that that doesn't mean that that's automatically mismanagement is always the Oh, absolutely not, but it, it but it's a pretty damning evidence that such a centralized system as we have here in California, somebody that's supposed to be monitoring a very fragile ecosystem, people we pay shitloads of money to, yeah. is fucking it up. It's getting so bad, David, I'm leaving. I'm, I plan on leaving this state within the next year. I'm gone. I'm, go, I'm moving somewhere else. Okay. And that's simply yeah. because it, it, it's screwed. It's, it's done here. They, nobody has taken... Uh, an, uh, an initiative, and, and each individual, maybe I talk to some people who don't wash their car as much, maybe they take a couple less showers, and they're doing what they can do, but as a whole, the people who are supposed to be monitoring this thing, aren't. it's it's not working. It's, just it's caused not by working. the state in California, too, because it's, it's water management gone wrong because they found some fish that they said were endangered in the dams so they cut off the fucking water because they were afraid that that species of fish was going to become extinct by letting the water flow through from Oregon or Northern California down to Southern California. And we it's a similar, a similar problem in Spain as well because Barcelona takes a lot of the water from central Spain and a lot of people in central Spain are like, well, what, what does this city give back to the rest of the nation? Exactly, and as somebody who lives in the Los Angeles area, I fucking feel bad that I use any sort of excess water because I've seen the farms out there just recently where it's dead. There's no grass. There's no nothing growing on fucking dirt. And we got Nestle out there bottling water yet. They haven't quit their business of 
making bottled water for profit. We also had a problem that arose a couple uh, years ago is uh, they were going to build a really big solar uh, plant out in the desert here, enough to power all of California and some. Yep. And they ended up shutting it down because there is an endangered goat. And it's not endangered the species of goat, but it's endangered in that region they wanted to put the solar plant. Well, if they're worried, it was going to stand in the focal point of some mirrors or something. No, they don't. They, it would displace and kill the goat. Is they would have to move the goats or kill the goats to get them out of the area so they could build these solar plants. So now we can't have clean energy, and right now we have our nuke plant, San Onofre, is fucked up. So we have a lot of these uh, like backup plants that have been sitting mm -hmm. idle for a while are now mm -hmm. turning on, and people don't understand that the steam coming out of the stacks isn't fucking smoke. It's not coal burning. They're co-generation co plants where they burn natural gas. The natural gas heats water, turns steam, turns another turbine. And the steam comes out at the stacks. But over here in Redondo Beach, you have a movement saying, get rid of this power plant. Get rid of it. It's an eyesore. It's polluting our environment. And it's like, well, fuck you. We, nobody was doing anything about San Onofre for years, and now that got messed up. Right. And you have to run yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. You guys, I think Nick... Nick. I won't, Sorry, I won't I'm just jump in. I just want to jump in uh, before we go to more questions and answers because they're, they're coming in thick and fast. I wanted to not that I don't think that I'm not a, a techno utopian. I don't think technology can solve everything. But why is it that projects like the Seawater Greenhouse Project doesn't get more funding? So this was a project that was launched some time ago. I remember hearing a lot about it back in early 2000s, where you put a greenhouse along a shoreline. It takes up quite a lot of real estate, prime real estate, of course. But what it does is it naturally desalinates the water because the plants in the soil will clean the water. Then you have a condenser in the ceiling that then collects the water for drinking. And I wonder why this hasn't got more attention that, that, that it actually needs. And then also, I'd like to raise people's, uh, take people's attention to this video. It's often branded as the most important video you'll ever see, but it is very good. I don't know if it's the most important one, where you get this chap, Al Bartlett, who I think is a statistician. I'm not entirely sure what his, his job title was at the university that he taught at, where he takes people into concepts like power law, where people don't understand that, for example, if, if energy consumption increases by 10% per year, that means it doubles in seven years. And that fundamentally, people don't understand basic empirical maths and physics, mm -hmm. let alone all the stuff we get bogged down with with politics, because everyone's got an opinion on politics and resource allocation. But if we can't even get ourselves into a position where we can agree on the sums and, and, and the figures, his point is that people need a lesson in basic maths so they can understand that if you need 50 struggling power stations today to fund your country, then in, in, in seven years you're going to need 100. And that that power of fundamentally he's he's going to make the point by the end of the video that human notions of fairness directly conflict with nature that what we think is 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 fair goes against what nature is able to provide us with and that nature will ultimately win if we don't sort this issue out which I thought was a really really very powerful point so we've had comments uh, particularly from Dan Gould or oh, my uh, Colors all gone wrong. Yeah, we go. Um, Chris, when people are forced into government courts of justice, just the opinion of lawyers, liars, are enough to apply the laws to people. No empirical evidence. Yeah, I agree, and that's why I encourage you to look at Derek J and his um, non his victimless crime spree. He was taking cameras into courtrooms, and then he was like, you know, the defendant was actually giving a kind of a lecture on the Constitution to the judge and, and one of the witnesses, one of the police officers as witness. And actually, the judge was kind of coming around, right? Like, the judge was kind of listening to these arguments and was actually kind of going, yeah, that's a good point. Why are you giving this guy a parking ticket? He didn't actually create a victim. Like, show me the body, you know? Um, so, yeah, I agree with that. Then we've got Alan Bell, who's yeah, going to come in. Yeah, that's a great video. And he's going to say, uh, as long as you have monetary system, people will be forced to obey and enforce unjust laws. Yes. Even if the money is Bitcoin, you are all talking about just parts of a well-designed system of control. We need to build a whole new system. Think out. That's a good point. Like, if I'd like to make a is, comment on that. Is, yep. It's open source. So even if you don't like Bitcoin as money, you can make your own money. That's why when I'm, every, yeah. anybody ever says they're worried that the NSA made Bitcoin, I'm like, it's open source. Just take the parts out of it that yeah, the NSA what Alan is corrupting is saying, and put them in new, put in new what ones. What Alan is saying is the macro system is broken. So it's not the art. It doesn't finish with Bitcoin. It starts with Bitcoin. 
Like, oh, okay, I get that. Take, take, take I, for I example, that. John. Let's take for example John Matonis. Sorry, John, I always pick on you, but it's nothing personal. Like when he used that phrase that the Bitcoin Foundation has excess transparency, I was like, well, what does that mean exactly? What do you mean by excess transparency? Is that is that not? Would you prefer a little bit more privacy? And if so, what do you want the privacy for? I think what's powerful about the Ethereum idea, not not the delivery of it, because I'm very skeptical of the delivery, but the idea of Bitcoin as a state transition system, where I I accept that certain things need to happen in private, especially from our peers. But what I disagree with is this constant need to like do all these backroom deals, mask over what happened, the sequence in which it happened can all be masked over, because remember, sequence is important. Just because the outcome is the same doesn't mean the way you got there was necessarily the right way of doing things. That actually what we need to be thinking about, if I can sort of empathize with Alan's point, I hope I'm not misrepresenting you, Alan, is that the whole system needs to be changed root and branch like the whole way we're thinking. Bitcoin gives us a basic framework. We can look at the way Satoshi approached the problem, which was this permissionless action that she took, where it was just like, right, this idea has been plaguing me for some time, and the very first thing she does is she codes it. She doesn't release a white paper. She doesn't do a blog post. She doesn't go asking regulators for permission. She writes the damn thing, sends out an email, goes on p2p.org and says, right, I've made this thing and I'm not quite sure how it works, but you know, this was the idea and what do you guys think? And then you know, they come back and they iterate and she's around for what, like two years, a year and a half, two years? And eventually I think she probably, I think she left because the, the Bitcoin talk forum was just getting bogged down with marketing and promotion. Like she does a little bit because she makes the logo and she's like, "How? what do you think of this logo? And then they try to get WikiLeaks involved. Someone comes in as a cheerleader and goes, let's get WikiLeaks involved. Let's get it into Occupy. And she's like, no, let's not get it into WikiLeaks. This is a very, very fragile network. If we don't look after this, then it's going to come under attack. And I, I think that's what's been going on on these forums, like these subreddits where people come on and say, I've lost all my money. And it's like, well, perhaps you should have questioned your motives at the outset. You weren't trying to, like, good usability design is when you work with the customer. You don't just take the customer's sentiment in terms of their money. You also listen to the customer's needs too. And you've always got this to and fro between designing and iterating and um, you know, going to your customer and seeing if it actually solves their problems. And you start with why. Why is the customer even here in the first place? What are they trying to do? What is that outcome? And how can we help them get to that outcome? And I think that's kind of where we need to get to. That's why I think these videos are a good fertile ground for us to do that so that we can actually have these discussions in the first place. Yeah, I, I, I think I just thinking about what you were just saying, Chris, and going back to the original thing of why I got brought in because I was just kind of playing devil's advocate and having a counterpoint to Jimmy and Nick about being anti-government or not. Um, I think government can learn, well, that the idea of government can borrow from um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies because the thing that cryptocurrency does, which is very good, and this is something you, you, I'm, I'm actually quoting you, Chris, from, from your talks, Cryptocurrency takes the job of the banker and reduces it down to an algorithm. Now, the whole idea, the direction I'm coming from when I'm sort of defending sort of government control things is not because I like politicians or have any sort of political views. I just believe in like central, fair, systematic implementation of agreed policies. And an algorithm is a perfect way of doing that because it takes out all of the personal biases and bullshit that people bring into things for whatever, for good or for real reason. An algorithm is an algorithm. And if we had something like that, I don't know how you do it. Again, it sounds utopian, but I think if we could take the politicians out and replace them with algorithms, that would give so us a lot. This is a good insight. We're all politicians in the sense we're all members of the polis. The police. Um, the, the, in ancient Greek, the police is, was the city, but it was like citizenry. So the problem is we outsource our power to these politicians. We've all got the ability to point at things and then express an opinion, which is all these politicians tend to do anyway. And then they make gaffes, and then they get they have to resign. And there's all the, it's just it. 
there's Alan points making a, a, a good point. He makes an excellent point actually. He's, robots will build the roads. Robots will also be our armies. You guys need to chat about the singularity as well. And then he makes a, another excellent point where he says, get this, the only chance humanity has is to make a world that is so beautiful that you wouldn't dare destroy it. Artificial intelligence will predict the future, even if it has to create it. That we can make a, so beauty, as I understand it, I, I very much like uh, Alexander Nehemiah, who says that beauty is a promise. It doesn't necessarily deliver, but it's a promise that says, if you bring me into your life, what lies behind my exterior will improve it in some way. And so you want to surround yourself with these beautiful objects. And that's why you're always checking, right? I'm checking, is it like making my life better? Is it making my life better? And that there is a future hope. There is a future that we can imagine as conscious beings that we can project into our mind, into our imagination, a past reordered, all the things we've seen before put into a new way imagined and as soon as you come up with an imagination that imagination becomes the past you now remember imagining it you can get attached to it but I think the way that we bring that future into the present is by trying to form an agreement between us in a civilized way in the way that we're doing now where we respect each other philia another Greek word um, uh, Greeks had four words for love agape which was like romantic love eros which was um, lustful love and then they had Storga, which was like a familiar love, like a, a family love. And then you have philia, which is friendship. And the whole point of philosophical discussion was that you could bring up your points without falling out, right? You can have a discussion, you can disagree all you want, but you don't have to fall out over it, right? You don't have to start punching each other. And the internet provides a great place to do that because you can't punch someone over the internet. And so I think he's absolutely right. We need to paint a picture yeah, like you, maybe I can give you a virus so I could steal your bitcoins if I knew how to, but it's, I think what Alan's saying is if we can paint a picture of the future that is so beautiful, just with discourse, just with language, which is also another way of controlling constraints, because of course, you know, in order for there to be, you know, you know, letters and things, you have to have contrast and barriers between the foreground and the background. If we can do that with language, if we can tell a story that people can come together around and try to work out, okay, where are the decisions that need to be made by humans? Where are the decisions that can be automated away with algorithms? And what decisions are we willing to leave to chance? Like if we can't agree on what to do next, can we all agree to leave it to the randomness of the universe? Something like that. Yeah. I would much rather have something like that than to say, no, I don't like what you're doing over there in London. Um, we're going to bomb the fuck out of you. I love this uh, I'm Bell not, a, I'm not a big uh, fan of uh, robots building roads and things like that. I like doing manual labor. I like lifting heavy things. So to me, that would be like taking away from something I would enjoy doing. Building my own road sounds like it would be fun. But it doesn't sound like it would be mandatory. Oh yeah, dude, I'm not saying being mandatory, but hell, you know, I might, I might well, you go can build and build some potholes. Do the manual work of building the robot. Uh, uh, it's not the same. It's not the same. It really isn't. I like I lifting heavy iron. things. I really do. I like lifting heavy things and like doing physical labor. That's maybe it's in my blood or something, but that's that's just something I enjoy doing. And I hate doing that sort of thing. So. And that's what's great, is we have a world that's full of individuals that like doing different things, different types of labor. I enjoy soldering and things, and, you know, I have a degree in electronics, and I was a mechanical engineer, and know how to do things like that. I can build, you know, I can build a generator, and I can make my own electricity if I want to. And David, he, he has a background in that sort of stuff, too. And we have people like Nick that like doing physical labor. Um, that doesn't mean that I want to say, well, Nick, he likes doing physical labor. I'm going to get my gun and come over here and force him to dig a well for me. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I, 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 I really want to pick up on this, because there's something one of the uh, Q&As said about that money is a problem, and I totally agree with that. I, I I would love to say goodbye, money. Please let the door hit your ass on the way out, um, because he, 
just let me give a, a hypothetical thing. Nurse gets out of bed, catches the bus to work, goes to hosp goes to work at hospital. The bus driver later in the day has a heart attack. Is tended to by that nurse. Where take and then t and then take that take that scenario, take money out of it. It still works because we could, we've all got different talents and different skills, and we can all do things that benefit each other. But is, isn't the idea um, that we measure our sacrifice, the time, money, sacrifice, where I say, look, if I've given you something, I also would like the, the freedom in the future to, to be able to have opportunities. So isn't that why we compensate each other? I'm not saying I, it's right, I'm just saying that's what we do at the moment. I don't even think you can even get rid of money at this point. I think no. it's something that's here forever because it's, uh, I mean, if we look at what a money is, money is supposed to be a commodity. Fiat money distorts all this and it becomes a commodity after being money and that's fucked, but traditionally money is a commodity that's used as a store of value for whatever reasons and it's used as a measurement of moving your value from one community or one exchange to another exchange that where the value that you had in the previous exchange, like let's say you said driving the bus, right? That doesn't yeah. really translate very well if you don't need the, the, if the nurse wasn't the one who rode your bus. But if the other nurse gave you a couple bucks and then you get over there and you you can pay the other nurse to uh, watch over you in your uh, in your heart. So I I, I get yeah. your point. Wait, wait. I completely agree with you, David. By the way, I completely agree with you. That I wish it would go yeah. away too. I just don't. It's it's a, I don't think it's a reality. I don't think it's I, ever I, going away. And I agree with you. I don't think it's going away either. Un unfortunately, I mean, it, actually, there's an interesting thing here in the U. Not here in the UK. I'm not in the UK just now. Sorry, I'm, I'm in Canada, but I'm from the UK. And over there, we have this thing called time banking, where people can volunteer to do tasks. They build up a credit of time, and then they can claim the time of other people who have offered services as well. And that's a very basic abstraction of money. And uh, and I think in principle that works really well. And I just wish, in the same way as Bitcoin, it could be spent more widely. Um, but I mean, to, just to be—I was trying not to, do, to be depressing and cynical. I'm trying to be idealistic. But all of the stuff we're talking about here, I think, is like fated to never happen because we're saying all these wonderful things, and you could have someone who says, "Yes, what you're saying is idealistic and beautiful in concept, but you are an infidel, so you must die." One sec. So I want to say what is money so what is money I've been thinking about this recently fundamentally what is it well it where where does it occupy it occupies the gap between my purchasing decisions and my commitments to labor so it seems to take up this vacuum of space between these decision points these turning points in my life and why does a sporting event take place it it takes place because enough people simultaneously agree that it will they coincide their actions and their decision makings. An investor decides to invest money in building a stadium. Enough people decide to invest in buying tickets. All of these commitments. It's almost as though money communicates movement over time, often outside of our generational perspective, outside of our, our actual lifetimes. That's why I'm so enamored by this kind of state transition system proposal, that actually what's important is our work, the content of our work, the actual meaning that, that is behind it. And at the moment, so far, money has just been too abstract. It's too abstract for the modern age. It doesn't communicate anything to me. I meet you, you tell me you've got money, I don't care. How did you get it? I've got no way of tracing back and saying, well, actually, maybe you've done something really good. However, the, the information about our money is more valuable than the money I'm going to claim. Because actually, if I start to realize that you're doing something with your money that's way more productive and valuable and, and according with my belief system than that guy over there, your money becomes more fungible in a way. It becomes more valuable. And I kind of want to see your money move. I want to see you exist, don't I? And I want to invest more of my money. Or my, I want to give you time. I'm giving you money to give you time so you can do more of what you've been doing before. Well, the problem is you've seen... Is you ask somebody, you meet somebody new and you say, oh, what do you do? First thing they tell you is what their profession is or what their job is. People define themselves by their profession. And, you know, most people, the only reason they go to work is to get, get a paycheck. Um, 
that you know a lot of people work in sh shit jobs work in a factory that just fucking hate their life they go there eight hours a day and just hate it um they would not do that job if they didn't get a paycheck for it um yeah, that that they're, they're listening to someone else's voice instead of their own. They're they're working to someone else's timetable, someone else's agenda, and they're paying too high a price for that time. They're, sorry, they're not being sorry, they're not being paid enough for that time. I mean, I've heard it said before: if you're getting paid less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're a slave, de facto. Your very existence is worth more than that, right? Like the very fact that you are a unique perspective on the world with an ever increasing, developing unique perspective. The quote from today's show for the title of the show is courage is always original so one of my favorite quotes from Wittgenstein not everyone's a fan of Wittgenstein but I think he really 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 nails it the reason why so many people on these crypto exchanges are getting it wrong is they're just copying one another they're all doing the same thing and they've been manipulated because they made themselves predictable they gave themselves a routine the routine was that you spend all day on an exchange buying low selling high except you don't what you do is you buy low and you, uh, you buy it high and then you sell low. You watch it go up and then you watch it go down again. And the people running the exchanges and the whales that have got more money than you and have got the ability to manipulate the message in the media, they pulled a number on you because you got predictable. And you should have just shown a little bit more insight about yourself, a little more introspection before you went in there. You've got to do what's different. Look at what everyone else is doing and do the opposite. I mean, and I people just aren't willing to commit that work. I just think I don't know. People need to believe in, like Alan is saying, people need to believe in something. People bigger. believe there's something. It's funny. Somebody easy told me illusion. they do. Oh, Go ahead, somebody Jamie. told me they do just the opposite of what Chris Ellis says, and they make money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just do what I don't do. Yeah. And I think also there's some sort of fundamental disconnect in senses of money because I mean we were all talking a while ago about money being a representation of time spent on a task and it being an abstraction to sort of liquidate that and transfer it between people and etc we know what we said but then there's this concept of let's make money as if you can engineer more time out of thin air and all, and all that and all of that comes back to fractional reserve banking and I need say no more because I'm sure everyone on this call and everyone watching this has got a, the same opinion about it than I do. Well, think about it like physics again. The fact is a ledger is a stateful system, but so is the universe that we live in. It is also a stateful system that has an infinite memory or the infinite capacity to remember. Just because we don't have access directly to its meaning doesn't mean we don't exist in that system. If somebody goes off and does something that you don't like, but later on you decide you want to reverse on the ledger, the, the universe still remembers. And that tiny little change will come back on you via chaos theory later on. Because your ledger no longer conforms to the universe's ledger, and but bringing I'm bringing that back to physics is is it's another thing that I find money to be in conflict with is the idea of conserved quantities. A closed system has got a constant amount of energy, and that does not change. If it does change, it is not a closed system. Yeah. Now my existence as a human being in time is finite. I have a start and an end. I if I'm making money, I'm somehow giving myself more or representing myself as having more time than I actually have. If money is supposed to represent time spent on something, and that's what it should be. But it's not. It's, it ends up getting like, it, it's like hacking a computer game these days. I'm just going to get bonus points and bonus points and bonus points. And it's nonsensical and it's not sustainable. You're trading your time for pleasures or gadgets and you know luxuries people like you know it's fucking insane people take an eight-year loan out on a goddamn car now I mean I got a 15-year loan on my house it's almost paid for and people take ha over half that on a goddamn car and the thing is about um, loans as well is but in everywhere, I think everywhere but the Islamic world, you have compound interest, which means that the time something is supposed to be worth geometrically increases over time. 
Islamic banking is a beautiful thing. Uh, yeah. I, 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 that's probably why uh, there's so much hate on that p region of the world at this point yes, in time. Yes, because, because that's the fundamental dispute. I mean, I've been speaking to guys, the guy that runs an Islamic bank, and I've been thinking of getting, because I've been closing down my bank accounts. And um, Although I do see a little bit of um, wordplay in the, in the way they define interest, and I have, do have some questions of whether or not they're just trying to have their cake and eat it. Because a lot I, of I believe that's changed over time, though, Chris, because in my researching on uh, uh, Islamic banking, they've been trying to, like, become more, you know, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Like uh, more like the the our traditional systems in order not to be so uh, like ostracized, so they can have access to similar you know markets and whatnot. So they have to change things around. But for the most part, Islamic banking is pretty slick. That's what the uh, Mongols took when they took over Asia. They were like, "Fuck this shit! It's awesome. Let's get this Islamic banking in our empire." And and just in case anyone who's listening doesn't know what we're talking about. My understanding of Islamic banking is that you can take a loan, but it's a f it, the interest is flat. It's either a flat fee or a percentage of what you borrowed, and it does not increase. Whereas compound interest, it's a certain it's a certain percent increase every year. That's what an APR is. So it's so if someone says, "Oh, I'm going to charge you four percent APR," that's four percent to the power of every year. But you have to pay that back. Yeah, and this is the like the loan sharks and also the payday loan companies. I, I find it oh. remarkable that Wonga is considered a sign of economic growth in this country. No, it's not. It's a sign. <laughs> it's the opposite of that. What you're doing is you're looking at one tiny little company that is profiting off the misery of other people because they can't do basic maths. They can't work out that this is worse than the cure. This is the cure is worse than the preventional one of those things. Yeah. I think. It's Twenty-three hundred percent APR. It, it's just disgusting. These places that take advantage. I mean, to charge somebody these outrageous fees because they have no other option is just fucking despicable. It is despicable. I'm surprised not more of them die and get burnt to the ground. I really fucking am. You charge somebody a thousand percent interest on a hundred dollars. Come the fuck! Somebody's taking a hundred dollar loan. They can't afford, yeah, uh, two thousand percent. I'm sorry, they can't afford two thousand dollars to pay back that hundred dollar loan. That's just never going to happen. You're fucking enslaving people. I'm surprised. Yeah. Like I said, they're not. They aren't just being drug out into the street and killed. That, that's eventually what's going to happen. And, and we're seeing these places. places. We're seeing these places, and what they're doing is they've set up stores like out in Los Angeles. They have it where. It's a 2,000% interest, and you can go in and get new rims for your fucking car. So I want 2,000% on my savings account. <laughs> Do you know what Fuck I mean? Yeah, I will loan anybody <laughs> all the money in my savings account, and I only want 15% a year. That's it. Yeah. I'll give you all my money for 15% a year. Way the fuck better than what these loan sharks are giving you. Well, yeah, the back in the 70s, um, or you... Remember the old show Good Times when, about Chicago? You know, the loan sharks on there were charging like 10% in fiction. But I, even the real interest, interest rates back in the 80s, the 70s and 80s, were like 18% for a home loan um, back when Reagan and Greenspan were around. It was 18%, I think, back then for a home loan. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this. I don't want it to stop. What should we do? We're um, gonna have to take a break for the bathroom pretty soon. Well, yeah, me too. Um, just uh, Alan Bell, dude, you've got to get in touch, uh, Chris at WorldCryptoNetwork.com because I'm really gonna have to change. to change the name of the show to Chris before the bathroom. Chris before the bathroom. Yeah. yeah. I need another coffee. I'm just feeling really pumped. Okay, so the value of life ranges from nothing to priceless. This is Alan Bell. Um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Money is a system of c control, not just trade. I hope one day to chat with you, Chris. Well, please, um, you need to come on the show because what you're saying, you also said something else. I hope I haven't lost it. Ah, really hate I've been trying to take screen grabs at the same time yeah. just in case we lose some of these questions. Because the yeah, so Q&A is hard to keep track of. Yeah, I mean, it's a yeah. great feature, but it doesn't persist the data. Well, Google, the NSA get the data, but we're not allowed the API to get in there. 
so they end up like keeping a copy of all this stuff. Um, but Dan Gould has been coming a lot, a lot of things. Bitcoin is a good start, but we can only bring a voluntary society one individual at a time. What's interesting about Bitcoin is it's very neutral. Oh, very neutral. It sounds like an oxymoron, but like you, it could either be used as a totalitarian instrument of, of destruction, or it can be used as a, a great liberating force, but it really behooves us to work that out. Oh, that was the point that Alan was making that I think we've lost. He was saying that the future is already here. It's like William Gibson's quote, the future's already arrived, it's just up to us to try and work out what to do with it. Like all the tools are here, everything, the, the seeds of everything are here, but now we need to start arranging it and we need to start putting it together. I really like that. I think he's absolutely right. Um, also, we've got Steve. Oh, let me just ad admit my weaknesses. Yeah, right. Gadgets. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I got a whole freaking, I got two cell phones here, an iPod, a Nexus tablet, I got another laptop off to the left, <laughs> another laptop to my right. Uh, oh man, I love the internet. I grew up on this shit, so I'm like, oh, I'm attached at the waist. See, I didn't get the internet until I was an adult. It was, well, I graduated from high school in 1988, so... It was like 96 before the internet. I actually had internet access at home. I think and the just first so time I played a mud I was like 9 or 10. I, I have to say the, the sound of an old dial-up modem connecting is, is like going through the wardrobe into Narnia. Hmm. Yeah, need that sound. That's what we should have at the beginning of this show, Chris, is the internet modem. <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, I'll look into that. I, I also I, really like ASCII art as well. Oh yeah, ASCII art's great, man. Fuck, that I was like a. Is. I used to. I remember I used to have this uh, old app that you could just load in JPEGs and it would turn them into ASCII art. It was a long time ago when I was a little kid. I loved it. Right. Who I wants to take over the now? show? Who wants to take over the show for like five, ten minutes whilst I go get a coffee and relieve myself? Do you got a video or something you can share on YouTube? And uh, why don't we just start talking commercial? about uh, altcoins or something? Yeah, so start talking about altcoins. Um, let me share my screen and I'll actually show the the catastrophe live on air as it as it takes place, and then you can just yeah take over me. I'll be back in a bit. And I don't yeah, know if anybody has really paid attention, but have you seen the uh, volume that Bitcoin has going for it right now? We haven't seen this kind of volume in over a month, so. Uh, even while it, I believe it's on a downtrend, I, I think the increase in volume is good, a good thing overall, and maybe hopefully it can continue and lead to a rally. I'm not going to call any bottoms or tops because that would be stupid of me, but I, I could see a rally uh, come into fruition if uh, the volume stays high. How, what is the, I haven't been watching the prices for very closely lately. I mean, what is the volume being like versus change in price? Well, normally uh, you don't really. Oh, Bitcoin isn't always needed large amounts of volume for volatility to you know yeah. move up and down. But lately, if you look at like from let's go to you know that middle of March till now, we have had very little volume on the Bitcoin uh, network. There just hasn't been that much transactions and buying and selling. There just really hasn't. Well, that means two things. Is either people are hoarding it and not using it, or there's with all these different services out there, there's possibly a lot of like off-chain transactions happening. I, I think that I think that's one of the things that's occurring that there's off-chain transactions because if you pay for Coinbase, you know, invoice on your Coinbase account, I don't I don't yeah. think that goes on the blockchain. And also, uh, a lot of the money that may have been being invested in like buying Bitcoin off exchanges and whatnot is now being invested into companies, like with the VCs and stuff. And I think yeah. that's maybe where like a lot of the dumb money went as they went into like trying to find the next Coinbase or BitPay or you know blockchain.info or something. And they're chasing you know that service so they can get a uh, grab on a part of market share while, instead of you know maybe holding Bitcoin and writing writing it out. So we'll see what happens with that. I, I think uh, volume going up is a good thing. And oh, we yeah. should be. We should. We should use that as a metric more so than 
at the price going down five, ten percent. Like, mm -hmm. I, if, if it goes below four, uh, five hundred, you're probably going to see a lot of buying. I, I don't have a lot of free fiat, but I sure would prefer to have a Bitcoin than five hundred dollars. At this point, that that to me, I, I, I believe it's worth more than five hundred dollars, and I'm going to be buying. I don't buy on exchanges. I only do local trades. Yeah. So it's a little harder for me to get my hands on uh, Bitcoin, but that that's that's my own personal reasons for that. As for the altcoins, Jesus. Yeah, what's going on there? Look, look, look at Chris's screen. Which one is he following right now? Oh, he's doing the BTC. One it is. He's doing BTC uh, 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 dollar on uh, oh, right, Bitstamp. Okay. But if you look in like Coin market cap, whoo wee! I mean, Litecoin is staying right around five bucks. Good for those guys. I hope they don't lose too much more. But uh, that's another thing. Their volume has been really high on uh, Litecoin, which is a good thing. Ripple's volume has been high. I bet it's because people are using Bitstamp and they uh, they are uh, Ripple, uh, whatever it's called. One of you know the freaking oracles or whatever, a Ripple Exchange, you can use Ripple to transfer dollars to uh, in and out of Bitstamp, I believe. But, yeah, yeah. like even Dark Coin's been getting hit hard, Via Coin, all these coins, gosh, red everywhere. But the volume, like I said, is on some of these is going up, and that's got to be a good sign for those coins because that means people are moving it back and forth. Their eyes are on the game. Yeah, Exactly. Uh, what, what, so, David, uh, any other coins you hold besides Bitcoin? I can't say I hold any other coins. The only coin I hold is Bitcoin. I watch the other ones. I just try to stay away from them. I don't feel like exploiting people who are not maybe not as privy to. Uh, I held to quite scams. a. I, I had, I had a pretty good portfolio. I had about four different currencies, but I just, I just decided it was just too much, and I consolidated everything. It was around the same time I started mining. And I and I and I had my mining set up to go into Cripsy, um, and then whenever Cripsy received anything, just sell it into Bitcoin. Um, I did have some. What I did do just as an experiment, I did do some trading on Darkcoin. Oh and yeah, I, and I did quite a spread of it, and most of my trades made a loss, but the one that made a gain made a good gain. Um, um, but yeah, at, at at the moment, I've got about maybe about two and less than two hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, and, and that's it at the moment. I did have a lot more Bitcoin, but um, let's just say I needed to liquidate assets. Oh yeah, it happens. I, I I've been buying groceries lately. Not so much that I need to, more that I want to. You know, mm -hmm. use my Bitcoin yeah. for that. I I just am trying to make like the conscious flip into using it more often for things I pay for. But, uh, yeah, I understand that. I, I I don't have a whole lot of Bitcoin either. I have thousands of dollars worth of Bitcoin, but I'm no by, by no means Bitcoin rich. Yes. I mean, I, I am quite lucky in that I bought a lot of Bitcoin last summer. Oh, yeah, they're good, for, good, good on that. Well, when it, the, the, the thing is, though, at the time, I didn't hold on to it. So I was buying and selling very quickly. I just wish I'd held on to it. But for, for what little bit I had left, and, and also in, in the uh, city I used to live in, I was sort of known as the resident Bitcoin expert, and there was a couple of businesses got hit with the crypto locker virus. Oh. So they asked me to pay the ransom and then, and then reimburse me in fiat. Uh, that was nice of you. That, that, that was a that was a service you. I I I don't know anybody personally who got hit by that, but that seemed like a pretty devastating thing. And I read just recently that they're like unlocking everybody's data now for free. Really? Did you hear about that? I swear. No. Let me find that. That's insane. Yeah, I, I, I swear I saw uh, uh, I I saw that somewhere and I skimmed through it. Because oh, yeah, Key offered free key to unlock ransom files. It was on the sixth. Here we go. Well, they, they I'm to... gonna post in chat so uh, Chris can share it. Huh? But yeah, it was. Because uh... I have to. I mean, oh, it is. Crypto crypto researchers have released it. It wasn't huh. the crypto locker people themselves. It was, uh, uh, no, they got they got a couple. 
Whoops, they got a copy of the database, the security experts did, they collaborated. I think it was um, security services were involved as well, the law <laughs> enforcement that we've been having a go at. Right. Um, and it turns out that the criminals, were the perpetrators, were not deleting the keys as they said they were. They were keeping them in the database. So then they managed to get everyone's uh, keys and then set up a new website saying, right, here's where you go to decrypt it. So, yeah, this is the article, Crypto Locker Victims Offered Free Key to Unlock Ransomed Files. And actually, you know, most people weren't paying it anyway because most people have backups. It's like, you know, I, I think it was it was an interesting con trick, but I thought that it was a little bit flawed in its planning because, you know. Well, uh, although on the flip side, it's when it first started, they were actually quite smart because they weren't asking so much that people would outright say there's no way I'm paying that. It, for a lot of people, for a lot of very desperate businesses, especially like the couple I came across, it was just easier just to pay the relatively small amount of money and make the problem go away. So, but, they, uh, so they were actually quite smart in making it a sustainable business. Right, that's crazy. Oh, that's yeah. funny. Just inviting Bryce Weiner. Oh, is he was, on? Well, he's just tweeted me saying, has he missed it? And I said, no, no, no keep, come on. I mean, we were going to do today about... We were, I wasn't going to spend this much time going through what we went through, but actually we were doing a really good job of it, so I thought I'd keep us going. Um, but I, we were going to be joined by Bryce Weiner, who's going to talk about uh, altcoins and this this collapse that we've had in the price. And I think you know everyone's intentions is starting to come to the fore. I think we're all starting to realize the real reason why these altcoins existed was to make more bitcoins. But then at the same time, We've also got a drop in the price of Bitcoin itself. And um, Dustin, BTC Art Gallery earlier made an excellent point. He said, where is it, where is it? Um, he says, uh, north of 13 million, oh, so Ethereum, north of $13 million, drying up altcoins. Bitcoin slips, alts slide. So, yeah, we've got a little bit of a dip, in, and he's laying it at the door of Ethereum. I think you're giving a lot of credit to Ethereum, but um, I can see how that might form, you know, an influencing factor in, in a relatively small illiquid market. I think as well, I mean, the novelty value is going to wear off these altcoins because, I mean, over the past, so like 10 months, has a lot of coins have appeared and people have been saying, oh, wow, this is like something I can mine. This is new and cool. And who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, and it's just like now we all can see they're just like pointless cookie cutter things. It's like, and what is the point of them? I mean, uh, I mean, when Doge came out, I mean, I was people who didn't really know about cryptocurrency and were walking up talking to me and says, and, and, and I said, oh, I'm, I'm interested in Doge, and it's like, and I had to go along with like this whole trend because like Doge was so popular, but I always said it defies common sense. Well, the thing is, if these altcoin communities actually made themselves useful and were going off and working on like interesting projects, a bit like what I think we're trying to do with World Crypto, where we're like, okay, well, since this thing is so new, it's, we've still got time to really shape it. Why don't we get everyone's um, ideas on board, since we've kind of self-selected anyway, um, and see where what we can do that is conducive to the industry as a whole. So looking at like the big picture, what can we do to help this movement go forward? And I don't think that's what the individuals within these coins have done. I think what they've done is they've got off and they've made t-shirts and they've made fancy looking websites and they've done a lot of promotional stuff that suits them, but they're not acting in the interests of everyone. I, what can I do to create a win-win such that what I do rewards both you and me? And that's not what they've been doing. It's all about rewarding me at the expense of someone else. And I and I mean, going back to the early conversation, that, that's what's happening on all of these markets with with everyone trading because no one there, there's no sort of fractional reserve going on with individuals trading between each other. So some people are gaining at the expense of others because at that level, the funds involved are a conserved quantity. It's a closed loop, 
and there are definitely winners and losers. You're not making money, you're taking it. Yeah, you're not adding anything to the system. Um, and I think it has something to do with the relationship between public and private interests. The most fascinating innovation, I thought, from Satoshi's uh, paper was the way it got the individual and the network to work in unison or to work in their harmony is a better word. So when I get what I want as a node, the network gets what it wants. In both cases, it's security, but they both need that security in different ways. I need to know that those coins are mine and that no one can take them away from me, no one can break the promise at the outset, but the network needs a commitment, um, you know, the one CPU, one vote idea, where the, 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 the network is kept resilient and actually the network hash rate is a signal of the price of fraud protection. The amount of energy being used to protect the network is exactly the amount of energy you need to protect it against fraud because you would rather mine honestly, Satoshi predicts, than try to attack the network if you're going to be rewarded with new coins in order to process the payments. I just think like the 140 year time horizon that she was talking about as opposed to a lot of these other coins that mine most of their coins in the first few weeks, you know, he was, she was just thinking much bigger picture and none of these coins are thinking big picture, they're just thinking like how do I get to the next level. Now we are joined by Victoria, hello. Oh, we can't hear you, we can't hear you. You need to work on your sound. So if you go up to the top, you've got like a little spanner setting, you need to set like your microphone up there. I don't think you're muted. You'll have to just play around for a little bit. And we'll just have to like talk and like you know chew the fat, and then eventually you'll come on. Oh, we had this problem with um, Fra Louis, our, our monk in Thailand. He ne he wanted to join us the other day, and he was having sound problems. You're gonna have to try troubleshooting, like logging out, logging back in, trying different microphones. So, Chris, how much do you think these like uh, 2.0 projects that are doing pre-sales are hampering the uh, altcoin market? The the pre sales thing's bullshit. The no, I just I just mean how uh, th do you believe that they're having an effect on the, the altcoin market or are, alt, is that part of why altcoins are slipping even though Bitcoin is going down like adding to it? Well, people the the altcoins the the, all, the whole market's going down because people want net present value. They want the money now, and also because a lot of people have been margin trading and they've been on uh, was it bit index, but would you call it bit? In something. Let me see if I can find that. Actually, there was a really good post. Here it is on Reddit. Yeah, and the more adoption that uh, merchants are taking Bitcoin, the more volume there is. So, a lot of these merchants have a very low operating profit margin. So they need to turn that around back into fiat quick. So they're immediately selling their Bitcoin for fiat and whatever the price happens to be and it always goes to the lowest bidder. Yeah, I think I think what happened, what was being reported on Reddit was that people had stop loss positions where once it went down lower than 520, it created a cascading effect where they were all the automatic the software was automatically where is it here it is automatically started putting in sell positions which is why despite the steep buy walls that we saw yesterday um, it still sold through those buy walls because people had already told it if it gets to this price sell were they uh, hit, did they hit those buy walls or were the buy walls pulled back now they Ooh, had different hits so that's the a volume good went up, actually uh, they probably were hit because the volume is a lot higher than it was last, uh, yesterday when we were talking get about much, it. Much, much richer information um, in them. At the moment, they don't have rich enough data. I would love to see a website that actually shows me whether a particular buy wall was present at the time when the, the price slid through it. That would signal a lot because that means someone's trying to play the market, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's that simultaneity. Like I agree that you know a few bids can be pulled from the market. I don't agree that they can all be pulled at the same time. That's called suspicious simultaneity, where you see lots of things independently all happening at once. That ain't a coincidence. 
and you see that a lot on the altcoin markets where you'll see these huge buy walls and then as soon as it approaches bam they're gone and that is how a lot of market manipulation has went on but I think people have caught on to that type of manipulation and know it's all fake now and you know those cons don't last long because it doesn't take people more than a couple days or well actually it takes a month or so before everybody catches on and then they don't work anymore yeah you, you the way you usually make money in a market is to keep trying different exploits until it stops working and it works for a while but then the market finds an increased efficiency let's see if we can get Victoria let's try and having trouble getting Victoria's sound to work no okay okay you're not muted because I I can mute you from here and I can turn the sound up have you set the um, the little toolbar up at the top in the menu have you set your microphone up oh you have okay ah did you install there's a plugin that you have to install did you install it before you started it uh. Hmm. Oh no! Well, actually, it must be something with Google. Then yeah, does does her maybe her Chrome need to be updated or something? What is that? What? Uh, oh, Chrome updates. Or, Chrome updates automatically. So you can do what Ksenia does, which is you can talk in the chat box, and I'll just read out what you say. Maybe your voice, but um. Yeah, otherwise we'll have to have you on another time. But of course, you're very welcome to stay. Um, but yeah, you can try using a different browser. Some people have tried using like Mozilla, try using Firefox and, and see if that if that works. But you can free, feel free to say whatever you want in the chat. And then there's a 30 second delay with YouTube. So it's worth you, you know, you can switch your screen off or something and, and just stick around and we can just read out. But what, 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 where are we taking this conversation? We've also got Bryce is also saying he wants to join us as well. So it could be cool. Where do we want to take this? Like, are these people, is this just a, a human, a waste of human capital? Right, all these people working for these altcoins and like, is it just a total waste of individual human capital? I don't know. I don't think that's any, I can answer that question. I think a lot of things are wastes, and a lot of people think they're you know worth their time doing. So, <laughs> what are you gonna do, right? Yeah, it's not really up to us to decide what other people do with their time. I guess we decide it's not worth it to us that it's a waste of time by not giving them our money and attention. I mean, that's the only thing I can I can think of it like. I mean, I, I don't approve of re most reality shows, yet a lot of people are about those. I find them wasteful. And, Christoph know. talks about ostracism as a counter incentive to the profit motive. But where do you draw that line? Because that can be pretty tyrannical, too. And he's an anarchist, no? If I put peer pressure on people, like drink driving in the UK, there was you know big ad campaigns in the UK in the 70s and 80s to peer pressure people into not doing it. Yeah, I I kind of like the idea of shunning or you know just not do. I won't go to a gas station or something if there's a police car there because I don't want to deal with you know the possibility of getting shot. Um, I'll go somewhere else, and not that I expect that there's going to be a crime in progress or something. It's just that I know the police are violent. I wonder like, okay, so you've got all these human hours. I wonder, I'm just looking through the subreddit of one of these altcoins now, and I wonder how many human hours per hour are being spent staring at charts, going up and down, reading Coindesk, going, you know, listening to people's opinions rather than looking for facts and doing their own fact-checking. Like Andy Carvin is a real trailblazer, you know, he's like, think before you tweet, like, go look that up. Don't just retweet that JPEG, go find out if it's true first. Like the MH17 crash, there was these tinfoil hat people trying to 
push out, propagandize, propagate these images of MH17 crash site pictures to make it look as though it was MH370, the one that went missing six months before. And I downloaded this picture going, right, well, I'm not retweeting this. Um, and I looked at it, and I took it into Photoshop, and the first thing I did was flip the image, rotated it. And I was like, oh, yeah, it's fake. I can see now that that's fake. And then someone said, no, no, you you need to look at this. So then I went off on a wild goose chase for half an hour. And then I ended up coming back to the conclusion that actually I was right in the first place. If you flip the image, it looked exactly like MH17. And I was going on to these um, forums with plane spotters. I've never knowingly taken part in a plane spotting community before, but I did this time. And these guys had been very, very rigorous and taken pictures of both of these planes from lots of different angles. Some of the angles, I can't even work out where they must have been when they were taking the picture. They looked like they were like in a helicopter or something taking the picture. And they'd very, very rigorously gone through, taken pictures from all these different angles, and you could piece together for yourself that that was MH17 that crashed in the Ukraine. So actually, it was someone who deliberately altered that picture to make it fit a narrative that they'd already agreed upon. They were doing exactly the same thing that, that our governments and corporations do by trying to control the perspective. I, I, to go back to the original question about how much human capital and hours are being wasted, um, we need to define what waste is. Uh, loss of opportunity. I, I mean, I don't just think. I don't just think in terms of time as what has happened. I think in terms of what could have happened but never was. I think in terms of what could be and what what I don't want to happen in the future and what I would like to happen. And I start assigning prob probabilities to things, don't I? Well, yeah, and and I think there definitely is. But quite where the quite where the line is, I don't know. And it's going to change from person to person. Because I mean, if you go around your local pound shop or Dollarama shop and if you look at all the useless, pointless, sparkly tap that's on sale there and then someone's been paid slave labour in a factory to make that piece of crap, well then sure, but I, I could be saying that about something that some little kid really loves and it's made their day. So. Yeah, and like I had said, it's not up to us to judge what other people do with their time, but you know, it's there's a lot of projects that there are brilliant people that are working on that I wish those same people that have that brilliant mind were working on a project that I want to see more work done on, but I don't want to, you know, I can't force them to quit working on the project that they're on to go work on the project I want them to work on. That's just not how things work. Yeah, unless you could provide for them. Well, if even if I could provide for them, it's not right for me to force them to go work on something else. Well, no, but you, no, but um, uh, um, a benevolent benefactor could offer them the opportunity at least. Yeah, I mean, if I if I had a bunch of money or a bunch of, you know, incentives to say, okay, um, so-and-so, here, I'll give you a, a new house and you can come live here if you work on this project that I'm interested in. Yeah, you know, but it would still be their choice to say, fuck you, that project is shit. I, I don't like that. So here's... um. Here's a good example of what I'm talking about. Let's try to diagnose, if we can, the cause for this phenomenon in the first place. Like, why are people here? So, Free Jack 2K2 says, um, I've, been, I've seen a lot of panic-induced posts the past couple of days asking or demanding to know what's happening with the branding and marketing effort of Litecoin. He's talking about, we are not sharing unfinished work with the outside world and we won't be because we're working through a lot of conceptual stuff and it takes time. So this is the same problem that we have at Feathercoin. Whenever the price went down, the first thing that people would do is they'd come knocking on your door saying, what are you doing about it? As if somehow they're not responsible for their own buying habits. Anyway, 
we never told people to buy it as an investment. We always said that this is a community-driven project and we, we all just want to contribute to and we want to give everyone the ability to have some impact on. And whether or not you went on an exchange, I, I met one guy offline who, whose name I won't mention who got very angry at me because he bought like $10,000 worth of Feathercoin. I'm like, well, why the fuck did you do that? <laughs> Show me the newsletter that I wrote where I said that you should go out and put ten thousand dollars into Feathercoin. Like, take this as a lesson that this is highly risky. And why didn't you get involved? Like, the reason I put so much time into those newsletters and forum posts was to try and get people working on projects. So look at this outsourcing. I think just so that people can respond. I think the problem here is waiting for someone else to do the work. People are on these forums and exchanges because they don't have anything else to do with their time. Society hasn't given them anything else. They've got nowhere else to go. They don't want to take a, job, a chance in the job market because the whole game looks like it's rigged. And so they come here because they've got nowhere else to go. But then when they do, I mean, basically, this is just one big long TLDR, by the way. He's just saying this is happening to all these coins. It's not just Litecoin. Um, and he's saying like that so at the end it's like and that's probably the only update we're going to give until we're done and ready to roll and basically you can STF you um, as it should be I'm a supporter of Litecoin but no one's really working together I don't see anyone like who subscribes to the Bitcoin developer mailing list like really I mean who reads it I maybe see a handful of people communicating their day to day but everyone's on Coindesk Everyone's reading all the titillating stories and like, oh, this venture capitalist is getting into it. And you know what? That narrative ain't working. The public aren't stupid. Fool me once. Yeah, fine. But fool me twice. No way. Like, you fooled us with the, the China narrative. You got us before that with the, you know, with the dollar parity. Do you remember when it got to a dollar? It's like dollar parity. And then it went up to 30 and then it crashed all the way back down again. What was the one that took us up to... 200 again it was the a6 plus Cypress that was a, a perfect storm seemed to come together there um, and people just aren't buying into these narratives anymore I think the reason the price is going down is because people were expecting 5x returns they bought into Bitcoin because they were expecting to go up five times you have brother John F who's a very smart guy but he was giving all these psychological price targets of you know it's going to go to three three thousand is the next target right so the, the sequence of events he was asking people to commit to, just like a company's boss does where he stands up and it's like, you're going to do sales, you're going to get people in the pipeline, you're going to do the suppliers. He was saying, right, we all need to get it up to 3,000, except people didn't have the money to get it up to 3,000. They'd already over-invested. And then when the price didn't go up 5x and it's now you know six months on and people look back going, oh, it hasn't, I haven't made that money I was hoping I was going to make, they sell it because they're like, well, I may as well. And then the last one out the door loses. The people yeah. that take the long-term perspective end up losing. Well, okay, not so necessarily. You, you don't Jamie? until you sell. Um, if if you're still holding, you haven't lost. Well, yeah, but eventually you need that money to live on. Well, yeah, and but look at, you know, okay, if you didn't lose your money in Gox and you had Bitcoin from before and you bought it at, you know, 200. It went up to 1200, 1300, whatever it was. Then it dropped back down again after that. Those guys were probably, you know, panicking when it was dropping from 1200. Oh shit! I should have sold. Well, you know, this crypto, Bitcoin, it's volatile as hell. It's playing with the volcano. Um. It should be obvious that it's going up and down. I think we tell people all the time, don't invest more than you can afford to lose. It's it's putting your money on the table and expect to lose it. It's it's like going to a casino. And I think that's of, not the tacit implication. Go ahead, David. I was gonna say, um in I mean in terms of the community as a whole, I mean the the volatility and that is induced by human behavior is, is self-defeating because the less stable it is, the less it's going to be actually used as a currency. I mean, because of the volatility, the best way for merchants it can be used is that they take Bitcoin and then cash out immediately. So, so there's like very little translation of value. I mean, very little change in value 
of the original transaction, which is then reducing Bitcoin from a currency to actually just a payment protocol. Yeah, that's right. And this here's here's the problem as I see it right here. It's this having your cake and eat it mentality where on the one hand we want to say don't treat it like an investment but here's a picture of a dog on a spaceship going to a moon and the implication here is absolutely clear right clearly there is an expectation of it going to somewhere far far away that's very very high up you know just like the price and I'm sorry but th this isn't acceptable this is why I was critical of Dogecoin when it first started I was like you know Palmer J Jackson Palmer just isn't being honest with people he's trying to say on the one hand it's like oh yeah you know it's all about altruism and giving and donating which is what we were saying at Feathercoin but of course he had a bigger budget right so he could make even bigger videos and he could go to Wired magazine and even bigger you know publicists and all he did was just look at this it's like and it's a race and it's zero sum and we will get to the top look at how expensive it's gonna get and if you buy now you've got to get in quick don't miss out fear of missing out, fear of missing out, I must buy, I must buy. And what will other people do when they see this video? I wonder, I think they're going to buy. So what will I do? I'm going to buy. And how much am I going to buy? Well, if I buy this much and it gets to this price, I'll make 150 grand. I could really do with 150 grand. And these are the sums. People are breaking open their spreadsheets. I wish I could be Google right now and go through some of the spreadsheets that were people were making, you know, looking at these expected returns. And it's like, look, you can make money with a, something you've already got called a graphic card and then you're going to go to the moon and it's just dishonest I'm sorry but that's just fraud you're not being open and honest with yourself about your expectations you're totally mismanaging people's expectations that's cruel that video is unbelievable it actually it looks like it should be a parody well, it does now, but at the time, everyone, I had people in Skype, like friends of mine going, oh, Chris, are you getting in on this Dogecoin thing? Like, are you going to get in on the pump? Like, no, fuck you. Like, no, it was just, it was just, it was, the whole thing was just a wretched thing. I, I did actually buy some Dogecoin once it had settled down after the first pump, because I thought, okay, cool project. They, they're saying they're going to get into tipping and stuff, which I was all, you know, I'm all for that. Um, but then as time went on, I was just like, I can't support this anymore. This is just, this is really cruel. You're really not treating people properly with all this shit. Mm. Bryce, talk hey. to us. Hey. Hey. You know, that's, that, you're, you're, you can see my dog in the background. Hi, guys, how you doing? Hey, hey. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Dogecoin thing is, is like uh, the stuff of legend among the, uh, the market and traders. There were a, a, a couple of uh, pump and dumpers that, uh, you know, a lot of the, the success of Dogecoin was, of course, the front loading of the mining. And we've seen a lot of that with uh, coins that have, been, that have come out since. I mean, that was a large part of the explosion of, of altcoins we've seen earlier this year. And that, uh, that front loading of the mining was taken advantage of by, by people who knew how the mechanics of crypto works. And they were just straight up pump and dumpers, and that that guy Wu Long uh, that you see uh, mentioned every now and then, and where you know they, he had Panda Coin and a whole bunch of other scam coins, and uh, tried to pump Uno to the same way, which was you know one of my friends or one of my favorites. So, and I didn't you know, and so that sort of you know Dogecoin kicked off a whole lot of things that we are still dealing with even today, uh, with the you know you you, you it. It's really, it didn't ever really become what I think the community wanted it to, but I think it had every bit as much of an effect on the alt market and how we do things and how we view coins that, that it always wanted to have. I just don't think it was exactly how they probably intended. No, and actually Jackson has said since then that this industry moves so quickly that what felt true six months ago doesn't feel true now. And it's very humbling experience as a as someone who um, was there at the beginning of a, a coins launch. You know, I joined in, and my friend Larissa echoes the same sentiments because she works or works with Earthcoin people. I just wanted to help out. I I saw Bush, you know, try something quite brave, and and he's a very shy guy. He doesn't like being in front of big audiences. He went out and he, he started his own coin because he was a hobbyist and he wanted to see something succeed. We thought, you know, we can get it working in Oxford, then we 
get it working in Hull and it could just be like this local, this sort of hyper local product and we created the map and everything. But it was just like as the industry kept moving forward, it was impossible to keep up with the change of events to the point where a year later you look back on it and go, gosh, that maybe have been a bit naive, but it wasn't that we were you know, that we, we absolutely thought we were doing the right thing when we were doing this. And it still feels like it could be true today, except the circumstances have changed so much that now, for me, it feels much more productive to help Bitcoin because my, I figure, well, if Bitcoin fails, they all fail. So actually, we all need to get, get behind Bitcoin now, don't we? Yeah, I, I, I think the Dogecoin now feels like, it, 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 it's like when you, if you go on a Friday or a Saturday night and get drunk, it seemed like a good idea at the time, but afterwards you're thinking, what the hell was I doing? Good enough. Um, and, and, I've, and I think the, the other thing about um, people getting into cryptocurrencies and altcoins is an interesting thing. A, a friend of mine, um, Paddy, who is watching, hi, um, he is a 3D graphics artist, and he was interested in doing some GPU mining, and I gave him some advice, but he realized he could actually make mom, ma, mine more money doing his job by actually creating 3D art than having it chew away on crypto hashes. Bryce? Oh, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, we were, last night, um, you know, we all know about Ferguson, and I'm sure you guys have already touched on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things, when I stood up in April and, and, and talked about altcoins and, and what I think they can do and the, the possibilities that they could fulfill. You know, one of those things was getting funding to where it's needed. And we, you know, quite literally, I could launch a coin, do a 50% pre-mine and an IPO, 500 BTC IPO, and, and list out all of the equipment and supplies that I would plan to buy with that IPO, and then rent a semi-truck and drive it to Ferguson, and we can keep those people going for months, months on end. And I can sit on Twitter all day long and pump that coin and send money to those people, because I actually um, uh, know where that money needs to go on the ground, the actual individuals who would need to receive it to, to, it, to, uh, to disperse it to the community properly. We've already started digging into this because if it gets any worse, that's exactly what I'm going to do. There's no um, reason not to. No one's ever going to tell us no. That's an interesting thing, but why not just use uh, regular Bitcoin donations? Why do you have to start a pre-mined altcoin? Have you seen the price of Bitcoin lately? If the if the if the the price of Bitcoin right now is so volatile that if we used Bitcoin to do it, we could have fifty you know twenty to thirty percent less than we intended, literally in twenty four hours. Okay, so what's the externality then? What's the payoff? What who has to take the other side of that bet? There is no bet, and that's the thing. This is if you want to call it, uh, you know. Uh, we could bring in Ethereum in on this, right? Everybody was saying that Ethereum was the future of crowdfunding, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we all know from their terms of service that they don't even have to deliver a product. It could all disappear yeah. tomorrow and it would all be totally legal. And, you know, while we are all, we're known entities, I'm sitting right here, you're sitting right here. I mean, we're, we're, we're actual human beings. And if we say we're going to do something like this, we're in the community. If I say I'm going to do something and people send hundreds of thousands of dollars to me in order for me to do it and I don't come through, number one, I'm going to go to jail. Number two, my career is ruined. I'm never going to be able to do anything in this space ever again. So there is zero incentive for someone like me to steal. So that's the end of risk. So the other side of this is now you get to go and help out the community of Ferguson in a very real way. You don't have to go and march and protest. You don't have to go and carry signs and put yourself in harm's way. However, you can help those who are doing that. Because in the you know in, in the final analysis, the reason why this pisses off people from so from all over the world is because there's this sense that we are all in this together. And that there's a, you know, Ferguson could be any town USA or any town Europe or any town Asia. It's just not the same. Uh, it's not like it was back in the day. We, we see right through this now. Right. And actually, people have been making comparisons on Twitter to Ukraine and saying this is how the conflict started in Ukraine with a standoff between the authorities and, and the police, the, the people, the citizenry. That's right. 
That's absolutely right. And then, of course, the United States got involved and Russia got involved and everybody started to move their little chess pieces around in order to jockey for position. And, you know, there, Russia today, Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera actually, I don't know if you've seen it, but there's actual video of Al Jazeera getting gassed yeah. by the St. Louis Sheriff's <laughs> Department. And then once they yeah. run off the reporters, the sheriffs actually dismantle their equipment. I mean, and, the, and of course, you know, the, the joke on Twitter was, here's the St. Louis Sheriff's Department literally dismantling the First Amendment. All Do you coins. ever worry, Bryce? Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I wondered if you were ever were concerned that the Bitcoin community itself has infiltrators from CIA, NSA, police, and I wondered if you saw that as a threat, because we're talking right now, but look at how we're doing this in the public. It's almost like this sort of radical transparency has now meant that the real threat is actually in keeping things a secret. Do you wonder whether there are some inside agents, you know, infiltrators, you know, conspiring to sabotage a lot of our efforts? I, you know, what's what's to sabotage other than tanking the price or posting FUD? And we do pl and we do right. plenty of that on our own, you know, within within the market. So why, you know, if if you and you know, Sun Tzu, it's, I quote this a lot. Uh, if your enemy is determined to destroy your, themselves, do not interrupt them. I don't necessarily know if the if federal agencies or intelligence agencies really need to get involved because we do a pretty good job discrediting ourselves on a daily basis. So I think that once the alt and, and I mean the alt market specifically, Bitcoin still has issues too. And and you know I I I very much respect a lot of uh, of the individuals that are out there um, uh, being a visible front to Bitcoin. But some of the organized decisions that are made on behalf of marketing or, or public relations, sometimes I just, I just, you know, do so do one of those because it, it it's plain to the internal crowd, and the internal crowd have been, have been fans of Bitcoin for years. You don't need to like please them, but it's everybody else in the world who thinks we're scary and weird and libertarian and anarcho-capitalist wackos that need to understand that this is just software, it's not a cult, you know, the I, people who think that Bitcoin is a cult are the ones who think money is a religion. Mm. You don't worship money. There's no need to worship money. This is just software. And that, once you get beyond that, I think that that's the real argument to acceptance. This is not scary stuff. There's like these Bitcoin 101 videos that are popping up. They're really great, actually. Some of them are, are incredibly great. And, and the information is really accurate. And I think it's just a matter of time. Stop trying to force it down people's throats. Just work, you know, do all of the things that got us here. Build the infrastructure, develop the applications, do things with it, with these coins. Bitcoin, I mean, this applies to everything, not just Bitcoin. Do things with these coins other than just trade them back and forth for money. And when that starts to happen, the value starts to go, the perceived value starts to go up. And as a result, the price starts to go up. And the utility goes up. And the velocity goes up. And everything wonderful that everybody wants to happen with these coins actually happens. But stop trying to convince the other guy to use it and actually give them a reason to use it. Okay, so how do we help out the people of Ferguson, your idea just now? Get involved. I mean, there are, how to put this? We're trying to develop a lot of uh, entrepreneurial opportunities, and, I, and I'm going to just go ahead and name drop because the, the space is so small, it's just us right now. Um, Crypto is, is a, a company that BlockTech is partnered with because their ecosystem allows for people to put coins on their network and then purchase these cards that they can resell themselves. So that's money that you could make if you buy a coin cheap and you put it on these cards, and then you resell the cards when the coin goes up, you start to make money. You take coins off the market, they can't be traded, which means they can't be dumped. So it tightens up market liquidity, and these coins are now held inside of this ecosystem. So until someone purchases those cards, number one, you make money, number two, they get the, the coins themselves, and the reason why they're buying them, we're assuming, is because there's a valuable use case. So all of this stuff sort of ties together, and unless people start bringing this all together, I think we're just going to see, you know, coins just start to fade out. But, There's just nothing to do with them but trade them back and forth. That's really boring. But I want to take this back to your idea about 
you know, setting up a coin for Ferguson. Could we go on like council party or whatever, one of these things, set up a, a coin or a, some kind of crypto equity for the people in Ferguson? And if we all pull together from different nation states, this could be a real moment in history, couldn't it? Where the whole world empathizes with these people. It's, und it's undeniable that that is a police state that we're looking at right there. I don't know how anyone can look at those pictures and read the stories of the journalists being arrested for no reason and say that's that's not unreasonable force. This is a criminal occupation. Well, what is it we'd be funding though? I mean, are we funding them to give them weapons to no, defend I themselves? Think what, or what? what? No, what actually, you're saying is funding them with supplies, aren't you? How about how about bottles of water and gas masks mm -hmm. and towels? Because and and the and the chemicals necessary, like um, oh goodness, I forgot what it was. But there's a, a an image I retweeted last night of the the various household chemicals that can be used to um, to soothe tear gas burns. No, I mean that that's stuff that's really valuable, and you may not be able to find that in that community because, quite frankly, it's a it's just a neighborhood. You know, it's not like it's a downtown urban area. This is a suburban neighborhood. So, did you want to say something, Jamie? No, I was just saying all you need for tear gas is milk. Even cow. still, there are, kid, there are kids in the neighborhood. They have to drink the milk. I mean, you know, life is still going on here. The, and eventually, the longer this lasts, people could not leave the neighborhood last night. Reporters were trapped inside the neighborhood. If you wanted to get out last night, you could not. So, I mean, if you want to talk about Gaza, that's exactly what we're doing to Ferguson. The exact same thing. They encircled it with a, with a paramilitary force and then proceeded to fire on, the, well, fire on it on the inside, fire into it. They started fires. And, I mean, you know, Jamie, you're, you're sitting there in what looks like a residential house. You're probably in a residential neighborhood. The police yep. just came down your street launching tear gas, and now your front yard is on fire. That's what happened last night in Ferguson. We saw it with uh, Boston yeah. bombings as well. After the Boston bombings, we saw the same kind of paramilitary force going down people's streets, and it has echoes That's of that a little bit. Yeah. This is not, it's not distant anymore. We can look at what's happening overseas, and we can see it right here in the, literally the center of our country. I mean, Ferguson is probably less than 12 hours driving from everywhere in the United States. So if you're actually that pissed off, why aren't you in your car already? You could actually be there, and you could actually let the rest of the world know and let the Ferguson police know that this is not going to be tolerated anymore. Maybe it is time to draw a line in the sand. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, and I think leadership comes from defining the urgency of now, to put you know, Martin Luther King's words to it. The fierce urgency of now is we need to find Bitcoiners that are local to this area who already have supply chains set up are able to receive the coins, liquidate the coins, buy supplies, and then take it to those people in that area. And you know what? It's, it's a really, at this point, if you look at the way the ecosystem works, we can just even tell people how to do it. You go to gift.com, you buy Amazon gift cards, we can publish a list of the things that those people need, and the last thing we need is an address to ship them to, and that's it. We can have funds and supplies moving into that area in 24 to 48 hours. I mean, it was just a matter of UPS. If the police have cordoned off the area, though, how are you going to get them into them? Um, there are several activists on Twitter um, that I've sort of been following, and I haven't necessarily reached out to them yet because I don't like to count my chickens before they're hatched. I don't necessarily think it's time for that level of funding and action yet. I don't think it's that extreme, and I think doing so at this point would be considered an escalation. However, it is something that we can keep in the background now for all of these sorts of events when this happens. You know, we're watching. And if a government or municipality does something that we don't like, we can direct global funding there like a laser in a matter of days. And that's just the simple reality of things now. If we use an altcoin or we use a bitcoin or use bitcoin, that it, it's really kind of irrelevant the mm -hmm. final analysis because the the real shocker is we can do it, and nobody's going to tell us no, and nobody can tell us no. It's not illegal. Mm. I like this laser. I like this um, imagery that you're bringing up here that we can that we're because uh, I've been arguing on this show for some time now that it's it's not 
people going to war with people, it's the people rebelling against their governments. We're under attack systematically by governments all over the world. And you've got Absolutely. Pictures, you've got pictures of people like Obama smiling and shaking hands with Gaddafi. This is like a big boys club. They're all in the same club together. We all rule over some people and we've all, we all know what we do behind closed doors. And it's like they're all in this together. It's really cynical. The King's Club. Yeah. Well, and you know, wars are won with money. We've seen it, you know, we, we've all, we, we all know our history. World War I built Wall Street. World War II was funded by Wall Street. Uh, quite frankly, this is our war. And we are, in effect, global financiers. And if we are really this politically motivated, and if we are really this passionate, we can direct money anywhere in the world to fund anything we want at almost any given time. And if we need to demonstrate that ability in Ferguson, I think that's an excellent opportunity to do so. What about cutting funding to the federal government and cutting funding to our local well, think of the, the, the end result of continuing to fund the people of Ferguson would be to bankrupt the city of Ferguson. We will simply win the war of attrition of money, and that's how wars are, are essentially won. I have more money than you. I can outspend you on tanks and bombs and guns. I can outspend you on tear gas, on anti-tear gas supplies. And, you know, go ahead. Spend yourself into oblivion. I don't mind. And make yourself look like an ass on international television doing so, please. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, the taxation system is taking money from all of us to fund the wars. If we quit giving and this is, or complying with it. You know, back in the day, they sold war bonds to raise money. Yep. And, and the public knew specific, I mean, what is that but a, but a pre-mine and a pre-sale to raise funds that you hope that in some, you know, in some future date that you're going to be able to cash this in for a greater value. But it wasn't really about making money because they were marketed as war bonds. You were Buying supporting a bomb. <laughs> that's right. You were supporting the effort to destroy the Nazis and free Europe. There's really no difference these days. We, you know, when if, if we want to do something like that, and again, I don't think it's necessarily the moment. I think it might be, I, I definitely think it would be an escalation to do so at this time. But it's possible, and we are going to, because people are seriously pissed off about this. And that's, it's the exact same thing, quite frankly, it's the exact same thing that I want to do with Palestine, except I can't get in there either. Ferguson is a little closer, and... It's not a complete military cordon with a you know 500 mile wall. It it is penetrable. You can get inside Ferguson with supplies, even if we have to pull the semi up a mile away and walk. We can get the supplies inside of Ferguson, and if it gets any worse, that's exactly what we're going to do. But it also we've got drones. I mean, you can buy consumer drones. That, see, why not? We can use them too. 150 bucks on Amazon, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and just drop the, you know, we could just airdrop water bottles one at a time. And if it takes all day and all night, who cares as long as it's getting done? I mean, just the spectacle alone would just cause a revolution. Just people watching other people taking action and actually doing what they can with what they have, which is what the politicians are supposed to do, except they're too busy telling 20 year olds to go kill themselves. Really? I mean, see, that's, it, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's really great that Bitcoin has all of these libertarian roots. However, it really doesn't matter much if you don't apply them. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? The time, it, you know, this is it. If you're not paying attention to, to what's going on right now, it's only going to get worse. So I think the communities for all, for all coins and for Bitcoin need to, need to kind of BTFD a little bit because it's getting pretty serious. There's eight billion dollars floating around in this magic internet money, and uh, we can make it do anything we want. Yeah, I've been surprised that I haven't gotten much of a backlash from the things that I say, like on this show, because you know some of the things I say are probably pretty radical to a lot of people yet, but I think people are really starting to see that these governments, even the United States government are really fucking oppressive. You're not a radical anymore. 
You're just watching right. the news. I yeah, mean, it's, like, it's not a matter of being a radical anymore. It's a matter of just being conscious. And, yeah, right. and the fact that it's gotten so far that that transition has now been made. I mean, wake up. We're here. Yeah, when it's in Newsweek. Right. Then, within well, one minute be... of the assault last night, within one minute, and I even mentioned this to, to a buddy of mine who was sitting there last night, within one minute of the Ferguson assault beginning last night, uh, and, and protest, I was watching it live. The protesters had their hands raised, and the police opened fire with tear gas and rubber bullets. Within one minute of that, Newsweek was tweeting um, this, the, uh, articles about how our police, how the police state became the police state. Not even put, pulling any punches. How our police became an army. I, I, within one minute, they already have the stories front loaded. I mean, yeah, what is, I was wearing, what people were accusing me of being a tinfoil hat wearing person just a few months ago is fucking news now. Yep. So our advantage is in our speed, our agility. Oh, absolutely. We can move money faster than anybody else in the world. It's one of the things that we tell people all the time. So unless you really want us to get organized and start moving money in places that might be inconvenient to the powers that be, it's probably a good idea to start behaving yourselves. Hmm. And, and that's a threat. I mean, straight up, that's a threat. Yeah, because if the people get organized, and we can organize in voluntary fashions, we don't have to force each other into it. Because we can, we can agree that what they're doing is fucked up. And when we see a peaceful crowd standing there with their hands up, and another group with guns and fucking grenade launchers and shit, opens fire with rubber bullets and tear gas to a group just because the sun goes down and says, you guys got to go home, but we're not denying your right to assemble over a loudspeaker. <laughs> I mean... This is your final warning. You are here. You are not supposed to be here, but it's okay. Yes. I Everything mean, is fine. Turn off your cameras, please. And tyranny is not around the corner. No, it's not. It's, it's literally on people's front doors now. Yeah. Um, it's not acceptable, and it amazes me. Anybody that does condone it, I mean, you got to be completely fucking brainwashed <clears throat> to believe that that is acceptable. And, and here's the thing. Here's the, the hard part, right? Turning to someone that you have respected or even loved for a very long time and they do not understand this and just looking at them and going, what? Like, who are you? Those conversations are probably happening all over the country right now. And this is not going away. This is worse than the 60s. And I hope people understand this. That, that just because, you know, you can look at those old black and white pictures of the 60s and have all kinds of, fog, you know, fond memories. We're all too young for that. We're all children of those people. So, so we were, you know, we kind of know what, what uh, how this feels for them because we were raised by them. Uh, and it's a, it's, it's a little different situation, too, than the hippie situation was anti-war and all that stuff, but... That was more of a communist movement, I think, than, uh, I'll give than you what that. we're talking about. But, however, you know, every, you know, all, like the alt market, politics is a lot like a Cambrian explosion of bad ideas. So, you know, granted, yeah, you know, if, if the hippie way of doing things was, was right, then our, we wouldn't be here having this conversation right now, quite frankly. Right. It would have worked. Um, but here we are 50 years later, and the same images, literally, and people have been doing this for days now, the same images from the 60s when, during the civil rights actions are, are being reenacted live, impromptu, uh, improv, by, by the St. Louis uh, Sheriff's Department and the people of Ferguson. The same pictures, image after image after image. It's the exact same thing happening all over again. And if our parents got pissed off 50 years ago, what is your fucking problem? Why, you know, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, I'm, you know, this is how I feel. I don't understand why people are not just raged about this. Yeah, I mean, somebody posted a thing on Twitter of Kent State, 
Oh. Absolutely. And, you know, I was in the National Guard, and we took Kent State thing very seriously because I was in the National Guard probably 15 years after that had happened in a different state. But, you know, that was one thing that we talked about on a regular basis because we're like, we cannot let that happen ever again. That's right. And, and, and now we're sitting here and now we're watching it. And apparently that message has been lost. I don't think so. I don't think it's been lost because here we are. And, and you know, the, the, thing that, that, the thing that I have the, the hardest time adjusting to, uh, you know, I'm just a guy like anybody else. And one of the th the hardest things I have to adjust to is we are those people. There's nobody else. Yeah. We're the ones having these conversations, and and we're the ones in this industry and in this community, and we have this knowledge and we have these talents. And if nobody else does it but us, nobody else will. It just won't get done. Yeah, and you know we might be at some risk by putting ourselves out in the public and talking like this. What's the um, risk? I mean, I, and what you know compared to what? But Chris had brought up a point earlier. The more of us that speak out, the more anonymity we have, because the harder it is to <laughs> um, find individuals in a larger group, and the more people speak out about it and are pissed off about it, the more impact there is. Could you imagine? Yeah, well, what that's would why. Happen? That's why I chose. Go ahead. I was just gonna say. Could you imagine what would happen if something bad happened to one of us after all of this? I mean, we need a You know, there's switch. a. What we? This is it. Twitter is it. What happens if I'm not on Twitter for three days? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You well, we know, need a dead man switch. There, there, there's a method to my madness in this. No, so so we got some some really good comments. I, I was going to say the reason I chose the the Wittgenstein quote as the title of today's show, "Courage is always original," is that you know just by doing what you what scares you the most will, in its own right, individuate you and have you stand out. Like anything that really scares you, and I'm not talking about putting 15 BTC on this big altcoin that's coming out. I'm talking about actual proper deliberative action, not what everyone else is doing because you're too busy you know, on a hope and a prayer, but actually doing something that makes a difference to someone's life. Now, we've got, I think it's Tom on World Crypto Network saying, Bryce is right, Ferguson is a siege and they have the castle. They only seem strong, castles are vulnerable. Tom has this wonderful kind of recurring motif where he brings back this the illusion of the wall. Um, and he also says, will Ferguson lead to a movement to demilitarize the police or just remilitarize the people in the militia? And Dan Gould is saying that there, were no in, there was no internet in the 1960s. So we have the tools now to collaborate. To We have the element of surprise. Because even though this is public, the NSA don't have the computational power to go through and semantically segment every single conversation to watch all of us at the same time would, need, would mean they'd need an equal population to do the monitoring. We have... Uh a worldwide communication network that is unparalleled to anything that has ever existed. And the speed of our communication and the broadness of it with the internet is incredible compared to what I had a frickin' party line on my telephone when I was growing up. It's so incredible that we can eat. we're broadcasting a frickin' TV show basically right now. Mm -hmm. And with, saying these things. Yeah. And we're talking to uh, a community of individuals, a group of people scared, scattered all around the world who do nothing but move money around all day long. And, and I, I cannot stress this point enough. If you go look at pictures of the New York Stock Exchange before World War I, it looked like the Bitcoin Center in New York. If you look at it after World War I, it got a lot larger, and there were a lot more people in that place, and they were doing a lot more business, moving a lot more money. So well, look at we're, we're financiers. 
we and I really want Bitcoiners and altcoiners to start looking at themselves that way as international financiers, and their activism, their economic and financial activism, can end censorship, can end oppression, because we can move money to the places where it's required so fast, faster than even the the the, the authorities can even physically react. What are they going to do? Shut down FedEx to St. Louis? Mm -hmm. Bryce is talking about action support team, a crypto red cross. Tom says, "I think I like that, a crypto red cross." And and Dan Gould congratulates Bryce. Uh, the risk is not doing anything. That's the biggest risk: is not taking a risk at all. Alan Bell is saying, "What the police state does is say to the slave, get back to work, you slave. The beatings will stop, and morale will improve." So it's like, yeah, you go go eat your cookie fried dough or whatever it is you got in your shopping malls and then you get back to work. And it's all about keeping you docile. And Bitcoin Rat, it seems like we got, basically, we, we tripled our audience because Bryce brought his, uh, his fan base with him. Thank you, Bryce. Uh, a Bitcoin Rat, I have every confidence that Bryce will do it. Um, yeah, so I don't want this to stop. But David, you haven't said anything in a while. Yeah, well, I, I've been I've been reading up about the situation, and I've been listening to what everyone's been saying. And I mean, I've just got some. I mean, I I agree with what Bryce is saying about dealing with the situation as it is now. But but the things I I've just got thinking about the root causes of it that bother me. Um, something we were talking about earlier on: lack of transparency. Because by by the sounds of it, this police officer should had no good reason to shoot the poor unfortunate young man uh, and people are skeptical and suspicious about the police service because the police service are not issuing details about the investigation so we need transparency and again taking things back if things were run according to algorithms and the data was out there that wouldn't have been a problem and, and the other thing I I think as well, and I'm an English person, so I've said I have probably very different views about firearms to, to the rest of you. But this whole thing, the stuff that Bryce is talking about doing, the stuff that's actually happened in Ferguson, it's all an escalation. It's uh, um, and where does that stop? Where does that stop? And, and I, I think it comes back to that the police officers anywhere should not be like Judge Bloody Dread, Judge Jury and Executioner. So right. I would call for non-lethal methods of apprehension and then have um, due, due process done on a person to determine their innocence or guilt rather than going, bam, bam, you're dead, especially when they're not even pointing a gun at anyone. You know, Mario Suvo, um, back in the 60s, had a very famous speech on, uh, on the courthouse front steps in California. And, it, and he said... Something to I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember the quote exactly, but it was it comes there comes a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious that you have to throw yourself upon the wheels and you have to throw yourself upon the gears and the machine must come to a halt. We're just about there. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not advocating violence. I am advocating taking those actions that will cause these things to stop. And, and quite frankly, the things that will cause these things to stop are thousands of people in the streets of Ferguson sitting down peaceably, refusing to be moved for any reason until, until these police are brought to justice. Yes. Yes. And, and we can keep them there with food and funding for as long as it takes to have that happen. Well, you might be able to. It depends what countermeasures are launched against those efforts. But I wish I'd look in the world to you. Well, and you know, it's a. It, but then you. But then you. You, just, you speak of a matter of escalation. Yes. And and what we want and what I believe that we should always strive to do is try everything possible before result before resorting to things that to which there is no going back again. And had the police and, done that in the first place, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Sir, absolutely. I, I could not agree more. Hmm. When does this conversation stop? I don't know that I want it to. 
<laughs> but uh, at the same time, it's like I, I keep thinking of um, Eric Schmidt's quote that the internet is the first thing that humanity has invented that humanity doesn't understand. It's a massive experiment in anarchy, and it just seems to be something like our whole. I'm reading a paper by um, the sociologist called Simondon or Simon Dunn, I don't actually know how you pronounce his name, He's I've just got to the part of the paper where he starts quoting Heidegger and he has a really good, it's called Simon Dunn's uh, Mechanology and the Techno-Social and he talks about how different periods of human history have been defined by different raison d'etre, different causes that they've had to go through. So early civilization was all about survival and then it was all about the development of language in the ancient post-Neolithic uh, tribes and then it was all about religion how do we relate to that which is beyond us uh, you know how do we relate to the unknowable and now it's all about technology and Simonon's going to single out a distinguishing characteristic of technology which is this relationship between the synthetic and the biological there's something about the, the, the techne, the art, the, meaning the origin of the word is art or craft, something like that from ancient Greek, and it's something to do with a biological desire. And as I said yesterday in the, in the Bitcoin talk show, capitalism is a surrender in the face of our desires. Like we give up, we say, fine, okay, we, can't, we can regulate these needs of ours, but why don't we just set up a civilization where we go around trying to meet one another's needs and let's try to regulate that, that flow and that change. And I think he's got a really interesting point here, that our modern civilization is defined by the techne and this, this technological drive that is taking us forward and there is something that is wanting to emerge from this process and some people are driving with the brakes on and other people are like yeah let's go let's go let's go and I wonder if there's more room for thought I wonder if this is the right thing to be doing to have this kind of discourse and dialogue I think it's just humanity I think it's just us just the way we do things and I think that there's a lot of frustration that, that builds up because, you know, if you want to compare it back to the 60s, here we are 50 years later dealing with the exact same shit in the exact same way with the exact same problems. So in a certain sense, we haven't come very far at all for all the amounts of gadgets and, and, and whatnot that we have. However, maybe, maybe you know, history travels in cycles. And perhaps this is the cycle where things change where things actually move because actually, as, as someone commented we have the internet now mm -hmm. and, and even this conversation is taking place globally and there are people watching globally and we are all now participating in Ferguson in a very real way we can, and that, sort of, that ability never existed before uh, in the history of the world so Maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe this is that, you know, the, the, the shot heard around the world for our generation. And that this is the tipping point for when things really start to roll. And we can start to say that we had, we had an effect on things and we didn't just make sure that it kept going. Well, the, the internet is the world's biggest copying machine. It is an amplifier of human nature. And what we are experiencing is an exponential increase of liquidity and heterogeneity of thought. Yep. And what we're finding out is, that even in conversations like this, that even when we disagree on, you know, the details of the issues, the, the reality of the situation is we are all, you know, working towards the same thing. Everybody in this space, whether you're in an altcoin or in Bitcoin or in, you know, one of the, you know, newer algorithms that are coming out, all of those, all of that stuff, we're all working towards the same goals, and that's economic independence and freedom from economic censorship, which, you know, just a quick plug, that's the, the topic of my speech this week at Crypto Lineup. Uh, these kinds of things are now important in a very real way. If the government is, if we do this, and the government suddenly passes legislation against cryptocurrencies to stop us from moving money to places where it's needed, then we're going to need all of these thousands of quote-unquote anonymous cryptocurrencies to move money around suddenly. So all of the stuff that we've been doing, it's, it's, like a, it's almost like a very delicate game of back and forth that without even realizing it, the alt market has been playing this game against Ferguson and the powers that be for months now. If all the shit goes down, we have the technology to make sure that the money can still flow to places where it's needed. And if they shut those down, we'll launch more of them. 
So where does that leave us with the altcoins? Perhaps we should start to summarize. Where, where, what, what is the point? Because we've got comment, comments coming in from Twitter that I won't read out because some of them are quite derogatory. But in particular, what they're pointing towards, Bryce, is that you know a lot of these coins are seen as pump and dumps that you've been or that you have a reputation for supporting coins and you know they go up and they go down and I've talked about it with Max Kaiser before Do, are you okay talking about that like I, I'm not sure. chasing ratings uh, let me just address um, no, Juicy G. No, cool. let, me, let, me just, sure. let me just address Juicy Grabs directly because he sent this message in about 16 minutes ago because I, yeah. I made a tweet saying my, my audience just doubled I'm not chasing ratings I think I've made it clear throughout I'm all about the quality not about the quantity I don't ask for money much on the show like if I remember to do it at all it's usually like buried somewhere in the comments I'm not really pushing for that kind of thing I'm living very 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 frugally a very uncomfortable lifestyle so that I can keep doing this and not pay taxes and so on so I'm not trying to chase ratings please I'm not trying to chase ratings but I think that what Bryce has said has not been pumpy dumpy at all I feel like yeah you come in you come in with some sensible comments and it should be about the quality of that content but Bryce go talk talk about this pump and dump uh, comment all right so here's the deal right I have eight coin networks that I that I'm responsible for at this time eight uh, I've launched uh, I think probably three or four of them myself and the others have been uh, communities that have reached out to me and said can you help us please so if all I were a pump and dumper First of all, you need an exit, right? That would be the great part about it. Uh, I've never exited. Uh, they're, they're mine. I'm invested in them. I take care of them because I'm invested in them. I provide use cases for coins. However, what the market really is used to, and they have been conditioned towards these large movements of money and these evolutions of hype cycles and if you don't see the patterns of pumps and the patterns of hype cycles suddenly people think that you're a scam when in fact all they have ever seen are scams and legitimate effort towards coins you know what there's a coin that behaves exactly like mine and we were kind of laughing about it on Twitter the uh, uh, with the uh, official account XC X currency they had a humongous push in the beginning, and the, the price dropped just like my coins do. But if you look at what X currency is doing, I, the, the conversation even started because I said, hey, look, those people actually get it. These but are is not. There, is there oh, sorry, anything you would do differently, given what we know now? Because given this. No, persistent... absolutely not. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. And, and the reason being is this the market. And I've said this, you know, and I'll even say it right here. I've said it on Twitter. I've said it in IRC chat rooms. The market is stupid. Quite frankly, it's dumb. It's been trained to think in particular ways because of the way that Bitcoin talk has dominated the conversation for so long. And that's been changing. Um, that the, these certain ways of thinking about things have been completely incorrect for months if not years and the entire extent of what I have done on Twitter is actually be a breath of reality into this nonsense that goes on. These anonymous coins, I've talked to uh, uh, Christoph Atlas uh, uh, like just jokingly a few times just kind of giggling with each other because the, the, the quote unquote anonymity of these coins you can still see your IP address in the mempool so who really cares if you're coin mixing after that? I mean, it, you're, it, it's already out there, you know. So the a lot of this, a lot of the hype that goes on about these coins, and everybody falls in love with a coin, and that's great. But I think that we've all had bad girlfriends too, and, and most of the alt market is just simply a bad girlfriend. And after you've had a bad girlfriend, you find out what a good girlfriend is, and then that's somebody you hang out with for a longer period. What do, what do you think is the risk? What do you think is the responsibility of somebody like well, you, me, Max Kaiser is probably more more has more influence than you and I do. But like, you remember his tweet uh, back in November where he's like, "Price point for LTC is fifty dollars." <laughs> What right. responsibility do we have as influencers, as people who are on social media and we attract a certain audience and they listen to us? Like, don't we have a responsibility to think before we tweet and maybe not promote a particular coin? Or I, like I do now, I just don't. I don't take any I side do. anymore. Like I do. People tweet me about coins all the time, and unless there's an overriding problem with a coin, you know, unless there's some 
major issue that is, um, you know, uh, something that's so important that it affects the entire economy or, and, and the entire industry, then I'll comment on it. Otherwise, you know, quite frankly, I talk about my coins. And if people don't like that, you know, tough shit. I, I've got eight networks. I talk to you. I talk to everybody in this industry. I have no problem talking about anybody's coins. But I'm not going to sit around and, you know, sometimes some people just say, hey, this coin, blah, 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 in the, just the hopes that I will tell them to fuck off so, that, so they will get a mention. So at this point, I, and at this point I, I have completely dialed back on, on commenting on coins without actually seeing something uh, from myself, you know, in, from my own uh, research. Because the market is so big now and that you, you just can't, it's really hard to keep up. Jane? And, yeah, and the way I see it is, I mean, like Rice, he's got, or Bryce, he's got a business. He's doing right. this as a freaking business. People got to remember that you, I, you're doing this for a fucking living. And and here's the great part, right? Everyone likes to say these coins are scams, except I've got eight networks and I started a company to take care of them. So, and if you've seen our, our webpage, there's a lot of people that work with me and we're actually launching more coins. Uh, we're going to have dozens of coins within the next 18 months. We have, I mean, these are contracts. These are business, and this is how the industry is evolving, and this is why I really don't care what Twitter says. We are actually entertaining contracts for coins that companies want to use in their own ecosystems and then enable the public to trade these coins and speculate on them at the same time. So what the markets need to understand is they are no longer driving the conversation. Business and industry are now driving the conversation. And the coins that you see coming out in the next 18 months are going to be coins with very specific use purposes that already exist. They already have homes. And if you think these, the, you know, these penny coins are, are, are worth money, wait till you see the ones that are going to come out in the next few months. Are you doing like, or oh, say for instance, what we have now, uh, like a store or whatever, will sell like gift cards. Um, and I can see uh, opportunity for altcoins to take that market where a store say, oh, you know, Best Buy, instead of selling gift cards, they have Best Buy coin where you buy so many Best Buy coins and then you can go on bestbuy.com or whatever and use Best Buy coins. Or like the PlayStation Network, they have their their uh, coin now or whatever. They've had that for a long time. You got to go in and buy, except for they only have, you know, you can buy a five dollar card, a ten dollar card, or whatever. But with cryptocurrency, you can buy specific amounts and not be tied to that certain level. But that certain level has with gift cards has been an advantage to the stores and a disadvantage to the consumer because it re they make you buy a card for $20 and then the product is always mm -hmm. less than that. Or also, they, never... they expire. They expire too. Yeah. Right. And, and you're absolutely correct. What, what you're talking about are loyalty programs that use custom coins where the vendor sets the, the, the coin price at a particular value and then sells and buys that back and forth from the customer in order to keep money inside of their own ecosystem. My favorite example of this is Starbucks. You know, the, the app that uh, people have on their phones for Starbucks could really actually be a cryptocurrency behind it and you would never even know it. Because yep. all Starbucks is doing is using that to send money back and forth to themselves once they charge your credit card for it. And then the companies could use that as an incentive program too, like airlines or credit cards give frequent flyer miles. That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely I, correct. And you can sign your wallet address to prove who you are, to verify your identity, and you don't need an ID. You do not need any, all of this nonsense that we have to say, you know, that we go through, uh, you know, this matter of social contracts, right? We yep. hand people our credit card, and then someone uses our credit card and then hands it back to us. And the only thing that's not stopping that person from robbing us blind is a social contract. 
that they're it's, going to get arrested. There's going to be penalties for this. Well, what, so what, now what, I can just... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, what, I think that's the future of altcoins that I kind of see, and I think that's what Bryce is working for with his company, that nobody's actually come right out and gave a real-world example of to, you and know, I, I really want a real idea of what it we're talking about. And I, I really want to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there, there was some, I'm, I also monitor the uh, Coin Markets IRC day trading chat room on uh, Altcoin Web. And someone had said, you started BlockTech? There is actually 20 founders, around 20 founders, not almost two dozen founders of BlockTech. And we all have our individual um, fields of expertise. Susan Heon is, a, uh, is an absolute hardware engineering genius. Um, Kirill Gurov, uh, our finance director. Joe Peck, our legal advisor. We all have these specific areas of expertise, but we all believe the same things in regard to the technology itself. That we all hold the same opinions as to how the technology itself and the infrastructure should be built and rolled out for cryptocurrencies to live up to all these promises that people have been posting on our Bitcoin for you know the past few years. It's really awesome that people have been talking about that for so long. And quite frankly, what block tech does is make that stuff happen. And there's this real disparity in people's minds between where we are with the technology and the infrastructure, where we want to go, and what needs to be done to get there. So if people want to troll me and be nasty, that's fine. I don't give a shit. I'm too busy working. Well, I, I would... I would say that I, I, what I don't like about a lot of these altcoins, particularly like the counterparty or like with the mastercoin thing, is that I have to go through an intermediary in order to express my sentiment in that market. I don't want more middlemen. I don't want more vouchers and systems where it's like, well, if you want to fund MadeSafe, you've got to buy mastercoin. It's like, no. Where's the buy side coming in? And what happened with MadeSafe is that well, they couldn't sell them because all the buy orders disappeared. Well, of course the buy orders disappeared. Markets are future pricing mechanisms. People took one look at the dynamic of the market and went, well, there's no fucking way I'm going to put a buy order in when someone's holding $2 million and they're ready to sell, you know? So I, I don't like these kind of more intermediaries. I think we should be using Bitcoin as, as much as possible whenever we can to fund a lot of these projects. And we should only really consider another altcoin if there is a specific localized reason to do so. I, I have a real, and I, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little bit of issue with what you said for one reason and one reason only. Um, I believe that Bitcoin whales are probably the absolute worst aspect of using the Bitcoin network for anything. And what the centralization of the um, actual currency units of Bitcoin has created is a de facto system where if those who hold the most amount of Bitcoin do not like what you are doing, they can tank the price of Bitcoin and effectively destroy whatever it is that you're doing. And what altcoins provide as opposed to Bitcoin are a way of decentralizing that authority. Because you can't be a whale in every single altcoin, believe me, I've tried. It costs too much money and you can't mine enough of the coins to do it. You've tried. I've tried. <laughs> I literally, well, because I wanted, to, I mean, not only, you know, if the theory worked, hey, great, this conversation would be much different. But, it, you know, it didn't work. And it proved my theory that altcoins really are the decentralization that Satoshi talked about in Bitcoin. Well, I, the, I've the argued for a long, nature of it. I've argued for a long time that what's decentralized is the idea, not the actual implementation, not the code. That's right. I couldn't but, agree more. I but why did you? But I'm still interested. I'm going to test you on this. Why did you try to manipulate the market? To see if it was possible. Because if I can do it, that means that somebody else can do it. And you know what? I, I have made a – outside of cryptocurrency, uh, my name has value as, as far as my career goes. I did have a life before all of this. I, I did work for Fortune 100 companies before all of this. So I have built my entire career on being ethical and operating from – you know, I will go out and try something that maybe somebody else wouldn't because there is some valuable knowledge in there. And I want to be able to go and see, you know, how, how bad is it really? Is Paul Krugman right? Are the detractors of Bitcoin right? Can, they, can the whole thing be gained to the point to, to absolute meaninglessness? And the, and the answer is no, it can't. 
Well, and the more altcoins right. we have, the less possible that becomes. You wouldn't you wouldn't really want to be a whale in one of these cryptocurrencies because if, as soon as you try to manipulate it, everyone just moves to a new coin. Everyone moves. That's to right. Coin. And and that's the problem. I think that, that that's some of the 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 psychological shock that uh, has been settling in on the Bitcoin side of things. And you know, I, I say that every coin is a shit coin, including Bitcoin. And if that wasn't true, we would not have the entire alt market. And well, if you all, include fiat currencies as well, then every coin sure. in the world is a damn shit coin. Absolutely. There you, I, I would make no distinction because the way that Bitcoin is computed, if you take the computations for how a cryptocurrency are, uh, is computed, you can go and you can, look on the, you can look online and you can read the source code and you can see exactly how Bitcoins are generated and then you can make an, an over what period, uh, you know, the emission period of the coins and then you can build a, a, a pricing structure where you anticipate the price to be. Goldman Sachs has done this and they said the price of one Bitcoin could reach as high as one million dollars one day. You can't do that with the M0 or M1 money supply. You can't take the computations of the electronic US dollar and figure out how the value of that dollar is generated. So in that very, when and because they are both electronic currencies, you can make those direct comparisons on a computer science level, not an economic level. And because Bitcoin derives its value from computer science and physics, suddenly Bitcoin has more compu computational value than the US dollar. And I think we're going to see that disparity uh, start to start to spread very soon. The more it catches on, the uh, as far as the the more money that that is flowing into the markets for, through use cases, I think the the greater that disparity is going to become obvious. Well, as Kaiser puts it, these cryptocurrencies are debt extinguishers because they're full asset reserved, backed by the laws of physics. No human has the ability to manipulate the results. And this well, is well, that's I, uh, you know, I, I take a little bit of issue with that because you, I mean, yeah, I mean, you got a coin, like feather coin is yours, right? Which coin is yours? Well, uh, it's not mine, but yeah. Well, was, you know, was, you know, it was very early on, yeah. No coins are mine. I call myself stewards of coins, and I say mm -hmm. my coins, but I mean, we all know that these are these are distributed entities. Nobody controls these things, right? But, but you know, even you can change your coin. You can hard fork and change the economics completely. You can change, and the Bitcoin itself, the Bitcoin Foundation, is in fact a centralized entity dictating monetary policy for the Bitcoin network. And the example of this is the transaction fees. Those are modified arbitrarily by the Bitcoin Foundation based on whatever they think is supposed to be going on. And there, you know, how many economists are on the on the uh, committee that decides uh, what the new TX should be? What's the what's the econo sound economic reasoning for the next 150 years as far as what changing the transaction fee would do and to what value? Who, who's responsible for this? Who are we trusting to make the proper decisions with these currencies to, uh, that, to give them the life that they promise? Quite frankly, I don't know. Well, I think what Kaiser would say, Kaiser in the past has cited um, Atlas Shrugged and he's saying, look, the, re the problem we've got is we've got one group of humans who tend to play by the rules and another group of humans who won't play unless they can cheat. And this is the problem with the bankers. If you, we looked at JP Morgan's so-called patent application yesterday, it's not. It's just they're basically trying to set up a game that they know they can cheat beforehand. Right. Well, and I, you know what? I'll be quite honest with you. Max Kaiser is one of the people that he's talking about. The entire launch of MaxCoin was an absolute disaster. And he made promises that were either, A, completely ignorant or intentionally deceptive. And, and people bought into that coin thinking they were going to be able to mine it with their CPUs. And, and suddenly, before they even realized it, it's SHA-3, which I have no idea why they didn't think someone was going to come up with a GPU miner for this. Be obviously because they have no idea what computer science is. So, you know, it's either... I, you, I, don't, I don't necessarily subscribe to the good guy, bad guy uh, methodology because either Max Kaiser is a bad guy or there's a third option, and that is people just don't necessarily understand what it is that they're doing, and they do stupid and dumb things in their own ignorance that, that tend to detract from the overall movement that we're trying to create from the momentum that we're trying to create. Well, so sometimes I, people make mistakes and then they're like, oh we're shit. We're all human. Right. 
and you know, it's hard. Has Max Kaiser you know. ever admitted that he made a mistake with the launch and he made a mistake with the promises that he made? I don't think so. I, I look, you know, everybody knows that Max Kaiser is an egotistical jackass. That's part of his appeal. So am I to a certain extent. I, I can appreciate that. I've However, only seen the show once, so I I don't tend to follow these guys. But you know, it's it's just you know I just got to think everybody is human and makes mistakes, and a lot of times they don't want to admit those mistakes. And even if they realize that they made a mistake. They want to cover their ass, and they got a lot invested to say Max Kaiser, if he fucked up with his coin, and he's like, oh, I got a lot invested in this. I don't want to admit that I fucked up. I'm going to lose my ass and my credibility. Well, people often teach what they need to learn the most, and that's what I find with Kaiser is that he is the very embodiment of the thing that he purports to hate. Um, <laughs> but that doesn't invalidate individual specific claims that he makes on his show so a separation of you know character and um, what is it practice and practitioner absolutely and, and and you know there there is a certain you know by the same token flip it around Max Kaiser is one of the loudest voices for cryptocurrencies his efforts towards spreading awareness of how these currencies works are work are absolutely invaluable I, there, I said it. However, when you say things like, if the three wise men were to show up today, they would have brought Jesus, LTC, BTC, and a quark. I mean, <laughs> God, you know, you have to be able to say, I'm sorry, I made a, I made a mistake. I mean, that's mm. just being human, like you said. And, and trying to pretend, just to gloss this over, and to pretend that these things didn't happen, uh, that, that just makes you disingenuous. And I think it takes away from the impact that the things that he says has. Mm. Well, the, it's been joked before that whenever he promotes a coin, it goes to Kaiser Island. You know, like right. it goes up and then it smashes down, and then there's, you know. People say that the same thing about when I start commenting on coins. I start talking about a coin, and like people go, oh shit, what's he going to say next? But it's like that dose of reality. If you don't hear what you want to hear, you're going to end up selling, and the price drops. But the, re the reason why these coins go down is because they're allowed to go up so quickly that. that that we create this hysteria and like some of it's well meaning yeah. and like black coin the guys are like full of energy and it's like yeah let's go and I love the enthusiasm when I met them in in DC and they would want to come on the show and they want to talk about their product I just need them to get it working on OS 10 first and we can go through it but look I'm all for the enthusiasm but we also have to think about what happens when the rubber hits the road and be a little bit more pragmatic in our decision making and let's and I always say trade wisely when Razor was launched and it hit the markets, 003 was the high. And then it slowly went down over time. Why? Because I was doing stuff. I didn't, I, I, I haven't hyped it very, you know, people say I hype it every time you talk about it, but you know what, then every time you see product placement in a movie, that's considered hype. So, you know, I'll take it for what it's worth. What happened to Nautilus coin? Uh, I am working on the, the uh, proof of stake system. With Brian Kelly, and I will, you know, since you kind of cornered me on it, I, I've been very silent about it, um, and so is Brian actually. And the reason being is we have come up with a brand new dynamic proof of stake system based on a completely new set of calculations. And quite frankly, it is just taking me this long to test the network to make sure they work. I very much am planning on doing a public beta test. To uh, to let the public, uh, well, to be perfectly honest, I want to see what the network does in a in a more public environment outside of my laboratory, and um, before launching it wholesale. So we're going to see a test net uh, uh, on that very very soon, and I'm trying to hold back what I'm saying because it is pretty exciting. So mm -hmm. if I'm sitting here stuttering and, and look searching for yeah, words, yeah. it's because I'm see. I'm trying not to write. I, that, but it's that anti-hype cycle, because mm -hmm. as soon as you remember, I used to go back in the you follow my Twitter feed for a while when we talked about Libra died and and when that was going to happen on the mirror chain. I would do I'm I would pre-announce announcements, and then I would say this is the end of announcement, and that became kind of a joke. And people are wondering where Libra died is. It's still here. Uh, how do you get coins to people in a foreign country 
and have them use it in their economy without things like ATMs. So the technology and infrastructure, I had the, the intent of doing LibreDog, still do, uh, but the, the infrastructure, in order to make that something practical and worthwhile, simply didn't exist. And it has taken months to build it, and it's still not ready. That's why I'm not in Brazil. And, and the only mistake that I made was thinking that I could get it done before the World Cup was finished. And that was absolutely, uh, that was impractical. But live and learn. I mean, that's, that's what we're here for. Nobody, people like to say that I'm an expert, and I, I just cringe because I'm not. Um, I just know a lot, I guess. And, I, and I'm a loudmouth. But uh, there are no experts. Nobody knows everything. Nobody we knows anything. Mistakes. That's right. I mean, we're we're just, we are we are all literally just making it up as we go along, and and I never you know when we're kids you don't really get that, but as you grow up you understand that even you know that's what everybody's doing. We're all just making it up as we go along. All right, well let's let's wrap up. I want to read out some of these things before we do. David, you haven't said anything in ages, mate. What's going on? What are you thinking? I'm just interestedly listening to all of this. I, I don't have anything to add at the moment because I haven't been well apart from Holocoin, I haven't been making any coins and. Um, we still haven't got that one going yet. Well, we're, I'm going to have to go because, well, we're all going to have to go because we've got the town hall meeting coming up in about yep. two and a half hours or three and a half hours. Uh, it's at 10 p.m. UTC. For now, we're going to use UTC. Um, Jamie was sort of telling me about it when we were talking off air, and I was like, yeah, you're right. Actually, we should just use that. Uh, some people have suggested we use the block height on the Bitcoin blockchain as a timekeeping system. The problem with that is a statistical average, so you can really, really get, get out of sync for that. But yeah, we do need a totally distributed clock now. We need to distribute time. Uh, we centralized time the same time we went off the gold standard around 1972. It's when we went to the cesium standard. Little fun facts for you. So 19, early 1970s weren't a good period for the civilization we live in today. Uh, so yeah, so we got uh, Bitcoin Talk says if Ferguson happened abroad, there would be calls for art to arm the protesters. It's a good point. And then Dan Gould, who's been with us throughout, thanks Dan. Uh, fear of voluntary societies equals fear of others and fear of yourself. Yeah, that's good. I think he might be quoting somebody um, who said that. How much quicker can individuals react to problems if not hampered by governments? A DD Scout 23 says. Absolutely good point. I've tried to copy paste all of these comments, of which there are far too many, but I'll just do these last two. Christopher B. King says in the late 90s there were hundreds of references to the revolution in military affairs in academic white papers referring to what happened to the military after the Soviets collapse. The military positioned US population as the enemy and armed police. Interesting. Um, and then I'll just end with this one, uh, another one from DD Scout saying, people are great problem solvers. It's incredible hubris to think that because you don't know how a solution can be solved right now with 10 minutes of thought that it can't be and won't be solved by billions of people working towards a fix. That's a awesome. great way to end the show. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. Please join us again in about two or three hours. We'll be going through our next town hall meeting to discuss the furtherment of this distributed movement called the World Crypto Network. Thanks very much, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>